Hi, everybody. My name is Bobby Sanabria. I've been an LP artist ever since the early 1980s, about 1983. So I have a long history uh, with the company. Very proud to be associated with this uh, company that is the number one company in terms of not only Latin percussion, but all forms of percussion all over the world. I've been asked by the head of education, Jules Thomas, and also the head of artist relations, Jerry Zacharias, to talk a little bit about my life. This is the 23rd chapter in LP Stories. There have been 22 other ones before me. So you can check out all of the great stories of the lives of uh, 22 other LP artists besides myself today beforehand, because all of these LP stories have been archived. Now, uh, if you hear any strange noises in the background at all, have no fear, I am here in my home in the Bronx, so you might hear some sounds uh, from the street, et cetera, et cetera. That's just because we're doing this live, <clears throat> no jive. Well, they asked me to uh, first speak about my life in the beginning, and then Jerry Zacharias is gonna come on, the head of artist relations. Uh, we'll be able to take your questions through the chat room live, so no tengan pena. Voy a tratar de hablar para nuestro televidente que están uh, en sintonizado ahora mismo en español también, porque hay mucha gente que habla en español en Sudamérica, Centroamérica, el Caribe y mundialmente. So uh, I might speak a, a little bit in Spanish for all of our viewers who only speak Spanish all over the world. Well, <clears throat> my story begins with the sound of what you're hearing right now, La Clave, which unites all of us. It's the rhythmic mantra of not only Afro-Cuban music, uh, Puerto Rican music, Dominican music, New Orleans second line, and of course, all of the uh, styles of music that we love and hear today from reggaeton to uh, funk, jazz, hip hop, of course, uh, pop music, rock music, et cetera, et cetera. Everything rhythmically that we do in popular music today is based on, believe it or not, this rhythmic cadence that we inherited from West and Central Africa. And for me, it started when I was born in the South Bronx in, on June 2nd, 1957, in an area called Fort Apache, which uh, the specific street that I first lived on was Fox Street. Okay, and then by the time I was three or four years old, it was the dream of any upwardly mobile middle, uh, excuse me, working class people in New York City, be, be they African American at the time, or Latino, or so-called white, to move on up to a New York City housing project. So at the age of three or four, we moved to the Melrose Projects in the South Bronx on East 153rd Street and Cortland Avenue in the South Bronx. The first building that I lived in was 281, which was right on Morris Avenue. Morris Avenue was particularly uh, inhabited by Italian Americans. There was still an Italian American enclave in the South Bronx. Now, uh, the Bronx is a very interesting place because people from East Harlem, which is known as Spanish Harlem in New York City, that's 90, that would be like 96th Street all the way to 125th Street, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, Park Madison, et cetera, 5th, uh, of the Puerto Rican community and of the Italian American community that live there. Uh, and any African Americans that were from Harlem, West Harlem, well, uh, housing was affordable in the South Bronx uh, at the time from the 1930s all the way up until the 1960s. You could get uh, a small house for a nominal fee, okay? So the Bronx was the destination for working class people, okay? Uh, and of course, uh, for my parents, who, Jose and Juanita, who are of Puerto, uh, Puerto Rican, I'm of Puerto Rican descent. I was born in New York City. I'm what they call a New York Rican. Well, the Bronx was like a paradise at the time that they first met. My father came from Guanica, Puerto Rico, which is a city on the uh, southern coast of the island. If you look at the 
the island in the middle and go down to the coast. It's Guanica, very famous city. It's where in 1898, US troops came in, took over the island, and eventually made it a colony of the United States. My mother, and it's a haven for sugarcane refineries. It was a haven for that. In fact, they had the biggest sugarcane refinery there. My mother's from uh, Juanita. She is from Jabucoa, Puerto Rico, on the east coast of the island. So mi padre son de Puerto Rico. Mi papá de la ciudad de Guanica, mi mamá de la ciudad de Yabucoa. Dos ciudades donde se cortaba caña. My mother from the east coast of the island, Yabucoa, her city was uh, also a sugarcane refinery town as well. They met in the South Bronx in New York City. I was born in 1957. My sister Joanne was born two years later uh, on, uh, in 1959. I was born in, we, bo we were both born in St. Francis Hospital. Those hospitals no longer exist. But anyway, long story short, we get to the projects. That Avenue, Morris Avenue, was uh, all Italian on the corner where 281 was. Then by the time I was in the, the second grade, uh, we moved to up the hill to 681. Cortland Avenue. The first apartment we lived in was 6A. The second apartment we lived in was 12A in 681. Uh, growing up in the South Bronx was very interesting. I mean, I remember distinctly one time having breakfast when, when we lived in 281, and all of a sudden I saw something pass by the kitchen window. It was unfortunately a baby that had fallen out of a, from an upper floor. And that's when the city locked down all the projects and uh, they basically put guardrails finally on all of the windows, okay? So to prevent that type of thing happening. Uh, in the beginning, uh, things were basically, uh, although people had their differences, et cetera, et cetera, I'm not gonna tell you, I'm not, sugar, I'm not gonna sugarcoat anything, but, uh, we got along basically because of one thing, the music. At the time, R&B, pop music uh, was ubiquitous in New York City, the sound of Motown, etc. cetera. And uh, the great thing about the Melrose Projects at the time was that it was predominantly African-American with a spattering of Puerto Rican families. There were still some Italian families living, even Irish families living in the projects at the time. There was even a small... German enclave still left on Melrose Avenue, a few blocks over. Uh, there was a German butcher shop. I remember when I was a kid, we used to go there my, with my mother and, and my mother didn't speak English. Uh, the woman behind the counter really didn't speak uh, English as well uh, or Spanish. So through sign language, etc., cetera, uh, <laughs> we were able to buy whatever we needed in terms of deli meat, et cetera, et cetera. But then th things started changing little by little, unfortunately. Um, the uh, construction of the Cross Bronx Expressway and the Bruckner Expressways, these two highways that went through the South Bronx uh, that were constructed by a uh, then gentleman who was given too much power at the time, uh, Robert Moses. He wanted it uh, to make it easier for people to get to Manhattan from Connecticut so they could see things like Broadway shows, et cetera, et cetera. So these two highways are cut like pincers through the South Bronx, and they uh, unfortunately miss, uh, people had to move out in droves. Over half a million people moved out of the the Bronx at the time, particularly the South Bronx because of the construction of these two highways, okay? When that happened, the property values went down in the neighborhoods. And then a gentleman by the name of Roger Starr, who was working for the then Lindsay administration in the 1960s, came up with this uh, idea of planned shrinkage. They wanted to rebuild and get rid of all of the tenements that were in the South Bronx at the time. These tenements that provided community for all of us. People would sit on the stoops, talk to their neighbors, et cetera. Kids would play in the streets, games like Ring Olivio, box ball with a small spalding, stick ball, et cetera. These are street games that New Yorkers of my age 
know very, very well. And some of you are probably smiling at the time. En ese momento, yo en el sur del Bronx, uh, desafortunadamente, construyeron dos autopistas que cortaron el sur del Bronx. El Cross Bronx Expressway y el Bronkner Expressway. Y eso fue uh, el comienzo de la destrucción del sur del Bronx. That was the beginning of the destruction of the South Bronx because of those two highways. The communities were displaced, everybody moved out. All of the factory work that existed in the South Bronx at the time for working class people was taken away. So migrant blacks from the South that had come to Harlem and then their dream of owning a home in the Bronx was destroyed as well. The same for the Puerto Rican community. The whites that were still there fled. There was a strong Jewish presence in the South Bronx as well because most of them owned all of the tenements and they would be the only ones that would rent to African Americans and to Puerto Ricans. But we were lucky because we were in the projects, okay? And unfortunately, the uh, because of the property values going down, banks wouldn't give loans out to uh, owners of tenements to maintain the buildings. Many of the landlords started burning the buildings to collect insurance money. At the same time, the Vietnam War was happening and many of our GIs were coming back addicted to heroin. So organized crime, which had a foothold in East Harlem, started flooding the South Bronx with heroin. And of course, one thing, these, so now it's all of these things happening all at the same time. Roger Starr came up with this idea, the gentleman I mentioned before, called plan shrinkage, because what the city wanted to do was get rid of all the tenements and put in high rises, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, not knowing or not realizing that the heart and soul of a community were in these tenements, in the neighborhoods. Okay, all of the people interacting with each other of all races, all colors, all creeds. And of course, being united by what? The music, as I said before, R&B, funk, the sound of Motown, but also the sound of salsa, Afro-Cuban music, the way we play it here in New York City with the Puerto Rican community. In any case, Roger Starr's idea was to... Uh, get rid of all of the people in the South Bronx, displace them so that they could go in and tear down all these tenements and reconstruct the South Bronx. Well, how are you going to get rid of a community? Well, he came up with this plan called Plan Shrinkage, which was cut the police services, shut down police precincts, shut down hospitals, stop garbage uh, collection, to the community, stop ambulance service to the community, little by little. In other words, shut down all of these social services that we all depend on and people will get disgusted and leave. But what he didn't count on was the resiliency of people like my parents and many, many other people in the South Bronx from the African-American and from the Puerto Rican community. And we stayed. But, of course, we all suffered at the time between the fires, the crime, the lack of hospital services, the lack of police services, the lack of ambulatory service. And they also closed down, and this was the killer, firehouses. So when these landlords would burn the buildings, they would just burn, okay, freely. So the community became completely devastated. And what was it that gave us resiliency and kept us together? What you're hearing now, la clave. ¿Qué fue la cosa que, que lo hizo sobrevivir toda la locura que estaban pasando en el sur del Bronx en esos momentos, en esos días? La quemada de los edificios, los drogadictos que estaban viniendo de Vietnam, de, de nuestra comunidad, el crimen, la falta de servicios locales, sociales, la cerrada de, uh, uh, de hospitales, de bomberos, de la policía, etc. Bueno, lo que lo hizo sobrevivir todo eso, lo que estoy tocando ahora mismo, la clave.
la musica. What made us, what helped us to survive and thrive eventually was what you're listening to, what I've been tapping out with my foot, la clave, the music, okay? Things are going crazy around you. My, it was a ritual for my sister and me, Joanne, after dinner, our window on the 12th floor in the 681 Cortland Avenue on East 153rd Street in the Melrose Projects, our kitchen window looked over the Bronx, the South Bronx. So we would, it was a ritual for us to count the fires at the end. And my mother would scream at us, Oye, ustedes, ¿qué es lo que están haciendo hoy? Ustedes no saben que hay gente sufriendo allá. Han perdido sus hogares por esos incendios. Hey, what are you doing there? Why are you looking out the window and looking at the fires like it's entertainment? Don't you understand that people are suffering out there? They lost their homes, etc. And of course, we would say, Ma, look, the, you know, what do, what do you expect us to do? Every window we go to, we can see what's going on. So, but what would, as I said, make us survive and thrive is the sound of this. In the evenings in the South Bronx, when I was growing up, you hear the sound of Cuban guaguancó being played in the parks, the rumba tradition by people, mostly Puerto Ricanos, that had adopted and adapted Afro-Cuban music because Cuba is an island that's basically right next to Puerto Rico. And the most popular music at the time in terms of Latin music from the 1930s all the way up until now in New York City has always been Afro-Cuban based music, what we call salsa. So we grew up with it. We adapted it. We adopted it. It became part of our ethos, part of our being as Puerto Ricanos, New Yorkans growing up in, in the South Bronx. So in the evenings, at night, everybody's, you know, 11, where most people are asleep at 11 o'clock on a weeknight or to midnight, you're listening to... Llegó Superman, oye, llegó Superman, bailando guaguancó, ya, ay, 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 ah, llegó Superman. That was what would put us to sleep. In fact, if you didn't hear conga drums, playing in the evenings in the South Bronx, people would call up the police station and complain, hey, I don't hear any conga drums happening out there in the park today. Something must be going down. Something must be wrong. Of course, in the projects that I grew up in, <clears throat> I, as I said before, I was very lucky because the Melrose projects were predominantly African-American. So I talked, I walked like all New Yorkans at the time and still today, we absorbed <clears throat> all of that culture and we were affected by it, okay? And that later would manifest itself in two forms of music, Latin boogaloo and hip hop. But let me tell you about some of the people that lived in the projects where I grew up in the Monroe's housing complex, okay? There was a gentleman by the name of uh, Francisco Bastar. You know him as Caco. Para la gente que están uh, mirando esto y no hablan uh, inglés, déjame decirte un poco sobre la gente que vivieron en los proyectos donde yo me crié. Por ejemplo, el gran Francisco Bastar. Caco, el timbalero de los alegres All-Stars. The great Caco, Francisco Bastar, of the Alegre All-Stars. The Alegre All-Stars were a super group made up of band leaders predominantly from that were signed to the Alegre record label and Alegre Records had their offices in the South Bronx. They were run by Al Santiago, great, another great New York Rican who used to be a saxophonist, a tenor saxophonist. He had a band called the Chacanunu Boys, but he realized he could make more money having a, not only a record store where he sold albums, 45s, etc., but also have his own record company. And he was inspired by the great recordings from Cuba of uh, these all-star uh, bands, 
particularly the albums called Descargas en Miniatura, Descargas en Miniature. What does the word descarga mean? In Spanish, it literally means to discharge something or unload something. But for us, musically, it means what? A jam session. So these recordings became like Bibles for us growing up in the South Bronx. Anybody that loved uh, Latin music, particularly Afro-Cuban music. So inspired by that, Al said, why don't we do the same type of albums with musicians here from New York? And the, mostly the musicians here from New York were uh, Puerto Ricanos. There were Cubans as well. And slowly but surely, the Dominican community was starting to rise uh, in the South Bronx, in Manhattan, and in Brooklyn. Okay, so predominantly the musicians were Puerto Rican on these albums for, with the Alegre All Stars, but there were Cubans as well as Dominicans. Okay, and so Caco, that was his nickname, he was the timbala player on these recordings and he was a hero to us. But where did he live? He lived in th the building 305, the building right across from me. And I used to play stickball and handball with uh, his nephews in the neighborhood. Now, for those of you who don't know what stickball is, we had rubber balls called Spaldings. They were the inside of uh, the leftovers of tennis balls that the Spaulding uh, ball company would consider rejects, and they were pink, okay? But they were high, under high pressure, and they were get, great to play handball with. New York City has handball courts all over where the projects are in the neighborhoods, but also to play stickball, which was our version of street baseball in New York City, okay? You take your mother's broomstick, take off the mop part portion of it, the metal attachment, scrape the bottom of it on the sidewalk, so you get a, the end, it becomes knobby, rounded, good, to match the round end on the other side. Maybe you put tape around the bottom of the bat for, as a grip. You play right in the street and you use the sewers as bases, you use cars as bases, etc. In those days, there weren't that many cars in New York City at the time. So for us as kids, it was great to play in the streets like that. Those those are what, two of the street games that we used to play. We used to play also uh, what we call Chinese box ball or box ball. If you walk in New York Street, in the New York City streets on the sidewalk, you notice that there's lines in the sidewalk where the cement ends and then the next block, the next part of the sidewalk commences, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you got a a straight wall on the side of a building. Now you have boxes and you could play a poor man's uh, uh, kind of a tennis on a New York City sidewalk. We used to call it Chinese box ball or box ball. You get five kids on the street, four kids, three kids, etc., hitting the ball to each box and bouncing it back to each other against the wall. Okay, it's like uh, it would be like table street ghetto table tennis. <laughs> Those are just examples of three games that we used to play back in the day when I was a kid. There was no such thing as looking at your uh, iPhone or smartphone and playing video games or any of that. All the things that we did were basically all in the street. Todos los juegos que nosotros jugábamos en esos días eran juegos de la calle, okay, como Chinese box ball, uh, stick ball que era como la pelota, pero en términos de la calle de Nueva York, etc., etc. So, these were the things that sustained us, along with the music that you heard. Of course, if you were Puerto Rican at the time, or Cuban or Dominican growing up in New York City, you heard what? Latin music in your house. You spoke Spanish in your house. My generation was basically the last generation that learned really how to speak Spanish on a somewhat fluent level, okay? My mother did not speak English at all. My father did, he learned. My mother didn't. I used to have to teach my mother English when I would do my homework. She would look at me and she'd try to do the homework with me as well. Can you imagine my mother looking over my shoulder? I'm in the first grade and I'm just going, see John Run, you know, all those little primary school books that we used to have back in the day. And my mother's trying to sound out the words along with me at the same time. But just to go show you how resilient my mother was, she eventually became an assistant teacher 
in the New York City public school system. But that's a whole nother uh, story. Okay, so we have Cuban music in the streets in New York City, particularly in the South Bronx where I grew up, representing by the drumming tradition, representing by the clave. We had it at home. We heard it on the radio. There were many, there were several stations that played Latin music. Radio Wado, W A D O, was the oldest uh, radio station that uh, was but uh, was a Spanish language radio station. Every Latino household in New York City had that radio station on in the morning because how did you wake up? You woke up to the smell of your mother making coffee and that station coming on on the air. Uh, everybody knew that that spoke Spanish, okay? But when I went outside into the street, okay, and talking with my friends and this and that, we were listening to what? We were listening to Motown music at the time, okay? So we heard all those great groups like Gladys Knight and the Pips, The Temptations. And of course, we heard the Godfather of Soul. He didn't record for Motown, but he was part of the black experience for anybody at that time. And still today, because he's the father of, in many ways of hip hop, because all of his drum beats are sampled, James Brown. So <clears throat> uh, DJ culture hadn't started yet in uh, the South Bronx, uh, it was coming though, it was coming. Because of the fires, because of Roger Starr's ridiculous plan to get rid of all of the people out of the South Bronx. El plan ese de Roger Starr para sacar todo el mundo de los vecindarios del sur del Bronx. Uh, well, the city started caving in. The city started also going bankrupt through all the malfeasance by all of the corrupt politicians at the time. At the time, the uh, New York City Police Department was so corrupt, it was unbelievable. If you want to get a good idea of how it was when I was growing up, you can watch two movies, The French Connection and Serpico. Si quieres tener una idea, Lo tiempo, eh, eh, sobre los tiempos donde, eh, de mi eh, juventud, pueden ver, mirar uh, dos películas, The French Connection y otra película con Al Pacino que se llama Serpico. Watch those two movies, you'll get a good idea of the New York City that I grew up in. But as I said, the thing that kept us together was the music. There were still church dances in New York City. There were still nightclubs in the South Bronx. In fact, the South Bronx at one time had more nightclubs or as many nightclubs than Manhattan. Can you believe that? Let's look at a little slide here to give you an example. Here is the club scene in the Bronx, okay? You see an ad for the Palladium Club, the Bronx Casino, and a few other nightclubs. Look at the artists that we had that my parents would go to dance to on a Friday or a Saturday night. Machito y su orquesta, Machito, the fathers of Afro-Cuban jazz. They were the first band to fuse jazz arranging technique with the spirit of the jazz musician, okay? They did that in 1939. They were formed in 1939 in Spanish Harlem. So Afro-Cuban jazz, <clears throat> excuse me, the first form of Latin jazz, doesn't start in Cuba or with Dizzy Gillespie. It starts with the Machito Afro-Cubans. So that's the environment that we were uh, growing up in. My parents would get dressed up on Friday nights or a Saturday, get a babysitter, et cetera, and they would go out dancing. And of course, when you go out dancing in those days, you go dressed to the nines. Me just wearing this uh, sports jacket is a carryover from that time period when I used to see my father get dressed, put on a shirt and tie, put on uh, maybe a vest with his, a three-piece suit, except take my mother out dancing. My mother looked beautiful, etc. Just amazing. And me and my sister would look at each other and go, wow, maybe one day we can do the same thing, okay? So, um, but little by little, all of the nightclub uh, culture started going away. Why? Because of the burning of the buildings in the South Bronx. Okay. At the same time, the city is going bankrupt. So what's the first thing that they do? The first thing that they do is they cut in all of the school programs, they cut music, theater, art, 
in all of the school programs in New York City to save money. So in the fifth grade, it was typical in uh, the New York City public school system. In the fifth or the sixth grade, the homeroom teacher would go to you. Who would like to learn a musical instrument? On this index card, in la escuela pública en esos tiempos, en Nueva York, uh, en lo que llamamos el homeroom, uh, la clase de casa en la escuela, donde uno se reúne por la mañana, en esos días, en el quinto grado o el sexto grado, la maestra o el maestro te daba una tarjetita y te decía, mira, pon aquí, escribe tres instrumentos en orden de preferencia que tú quieres aprender. Put on this index card three instruments that you'd like to learn how to play. So if you, you know, put trumpet, then maybe drums, then maybe clarinet or saxophone, those were the three instruments. Depending on the band director on what he needed to construct the orchestra, he would select. Okay, if you did, if he had enough trumpet players, then you go to your next choice. Maybe you wind up as a drummer or a saxophone player, etc. Like I just mentioned. Okay, but uh, those of the kids that didn't want to take any musical instrument, the homeroom teacher would ask, "Okay, those of you who don't want to study a musical instrument, raise your hand." Okay, you people are in the choir. Para la gente que no querían estudiar un instrumento musical, <coughs> los asignaban a cantar en el coro. <laughs> so, if you're in the choir, what do you do? You learn how to sing what? Harmony. And that's why we had such great doo-wop groups in New York City at the time. Great vocal harmony groups, great rock and roll groups, great R&B groups, right? So, uh, if you listen to the music of that time period coming out of New York City, especially from the African American community, you'll see what I mean. And it wasn't just great African American groups, great white groups, there were great white vocal harmony groups, etc. at the time period. Uh, and of course, in terms of Latin music, since you're listening to Cuban guaguancó in the parks and everybody's around like a cipher going around, hanging out, watching everybody play, you wouldn't see just Puerto Ricans and Cubans playing congas. You'd see African-Americans playing congas. You'd see Italian guys, Jewish guys, Irish guys learning how to play congas, play clave, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, the first percussion lesson I ever had, I was a little kid, I was 11 years old, and there were guys playing rumba in the park. And I'm watching, and a guy, and you use whatever instruments that uh, are available. It's not like in Cuba that everything is stylized. For example, everybody that's watching this knows in the rumba tradition, we have three congas, the quinto, the tres golpes, and uh, the salidor, the three drums. The quinto is the soloist. You have somebody hitting with sticks, what we call the guagua, the stick pattern. Somebody's playing the clave. The person playing the clave is usually the one singing. And maybe you had added shekere, et cetera. But in New York City, whatever was around, okay, you'd play clave on a beer bottle. Uh, you'd play guagua on the park bench, okay? Uh, or, <clears throat> excuse me. And if somebody had a cowbell, you'd play that. So somebody was playing a cowbell in this group of guys that was playing rumba. I was 11 years old, 12 years old. And I'm watching, and I, the guy can't keep up. I'm going to increase the tempo. So they're playing like this. That was the rhythm that the person that playing the kaba was supposed to be playing. But they couldn't keep up. So finally, I was scared. Finally, I said, I could do it. I could do it. And this guy, Chicky, who was lighter skinned than me, but he was Puerto Rican. He was an older guy. He was a friend of my cousin, John. He was, uh, Chicky was an electrician. He was the whitest Puerto Rican you could find, man. He had red hair, green eyes, but he could play the hell out of congas. So he, he let the kid play because he knew who I was. So I start playing and he goes, uh, nah, he can't do it. And then somebody, one of the other conga players, who also lived in my building. Uh, Chiki also lived in my building. He was a black Puerto Rican. I always, I wish I could remember his name, 
but he was a plumber, right? And he played great congas too. He goes, no, he's playing the right rhythm. He goes, kid, come over here. He shows me the cowbell. And I'm gonna use this L little LP bell to demonstrate. He goes, the bell is cracked on the side. That's why it sounds clangy when you played it. Grab it at the top and squeeze and it'll take the clanging out. So when they started again, and I played that for like about 10 minutes straight. And after the, uh, uh, I'm going to slow this down a little bit now. After they, uh, after we finished, Everybody started applauding and everything and surrounding me and this, that. That was my first percussion lesson. Who knows what would have happened if I hadn't been brave enough to yell out, hey, I can do it. Okay. And uh, when I did pick up that bell with the cracking and I started playing it, man, I started going, man, I'm playing the rhythm in time, but it, it sounds like crap. And that gentleman hit me to that, that the bell was cracked. If it wasn't for his kindness, okay. Who knows if you'd be talking to me uh, today. Okay. So let's look at the next slide. This is me at Cardinal Hayes High School in the South Bronx when I was 16 years old. <clears throat> I'm playing the timbales. And you notice that I'm playing a set of LP timbales. <laughs> I had saved up. When I was a kid, I used to actually write to the company to Marty Cohen, the founder, Martin Cohen, and tell him what I, I sent him a check. I remember, I think it was for five dollars for an LT LP black team ballad belt. And he sent me a kind note back that he doesn't take orders uh, in house or anything like that. Uh, so I wish I still had that, that correspondence from him, but I always remember that. So my association with LP goes way, way back. Uh, and at the time, it was a great thing because LP was the only company really that cared about our community. All of the other drum companies, they didn't, they didn't, uh, they weren't entrenched in our community. Martin was from the from the Bronx, and he went out to the clubs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, hanging out with the musicians. Looking at those pictures of those early endorsement photos of uh, LP artists, we used to be going, "Wow, check this out, man! Look at this." Look at Kako, he lives in my neighborhood. Look at Frankie Malave, the great conga player. Look at Mike Collazo, man. He goes, he went, he's uh, over near P PS52, et cetera. These musicians were all part of our community. But it wasn't just Latin musicians that lived in my neighborhood because I told you the Barrows Project was predominantly African American. So there was a great young drummer that was going to music and art high school at the time uh, who was a good friend of my cousin, John Collado, who I mentioned before. I'm talking about Howard King. Howard was 15, 16 years old. Maybe he was 17. And he was playing with people like McCoy Tyner, drum set, uh, Gary Bartz, the great alto and soprano saxophonist. And he lived in the same building as my cousin. My cousin John goes to me, hey, Bobby, you want to meet a real drummer? I go, yeah, because I was interested in jazz as well because I had seen and heard jazz on TV. All of the TV shows had jazz orchestras like the Ed Sullivan Show, the Johnny Carson Tonight Show, et cetera, et cetera. All the cartoons when I was growing up had jazz as part of their soundtrack. So I said, yeah, I want to meet him. Man. So one day we're walking. He goes, oh, there's Howard over there. So Howard had a small MG, which is a British car, and he introduces me, John introduces me to Howard. I'm 12 years old, 11 years old. And I look up to him and he goes, hey, how you doing, Bobby? This and that. And yeah, my cousin, man, he loves jazz. He's interested in that. But he also plays salsa, et cetera. He's interested in that as well. Uh, and uh, I wasn't even playing professionally yet or anything. I just was a, an enthusiast and was absorbed and possessed by the music. So Howard... I go, where are you? I said to Howard, where are your drums? So he opens up the trunk in the back. There's a little 18-inch bass drum. I never had even seen a little 18-inch bass drum. And his tom-toms were in the back seat, et cetera. And I started guessing, why is the bass drum so small? He goes, ah, because in jazz, we use a smaller bass drum with small groups, and it fits in the car. 
et cetera, et cetera. So Howard lived in the neighborhood. At one time, at three o'clock in the morning, he starts playing. He starts playing some funk on the drums. And he must have done that for about half an hour. When he finished, and this was a weeknight, when he finished, all of a sudden you heard silence. And then 10 seconds later, somebody yells out from the from one of the apartments in the project. Yo, man, that was dope. Why'd you freaking stop? <laughs> and everybody was going, yeah, yeah. So that's how it was for me growing up in the South Bronx. The music was an integral part of our being. It gave us life. It gave us uh, sustenance, okay? But unfortunately, the Bronx was in total decay because of the fires, the malfeasance of the city. And that finally came to a head in 1977 with the blackout and the riots that happened not only in the Bronx, in the South Bronx, but in South Brooklyn. They, and the community went just went buck wild. They couldn't take it anymore. That was the summer of Sam, the, the, the mass murderer that was going throughout shooting people in lovers' lanes at the time in 1977. But let's look at the next slide. This is me uh, in, uh, nope, the year is wrong, but the year is like 1975, 1976, not 1980. This is me at the Berkeley College of Music in Boston. I was a freshman and I'm playing a set of LP congas and those timbales that you saw from way back when I was 16 years old. I was in high school band at the time and Mr. Ryan, the uh, high school band director that we had, I played snare drum. I was learning orchestra bells and all that, reading, learning how to read music and this and that. And there, were, there was me and a gentleman by the name of David Carmona, who was of Costa Rican descent, but he lived in Manhattan, but he took the subway to come up to the South Bronx to go to Cardinal Hayes High School. Some of you might know Cardinal Hayes High School because it's the school that Regis Philbin graduated from. Also, Willie Colon, the, not the Salcedo, but the, the linebacker that used to play for the New York Jets. And uh, who else went to? Oh, George Carlin, the great comedian, at one time went to my high school. Yo me gradué de una escuela superior que se llama Cardinal Hayes. La foto que viste de... Uh, uh, de, fue, uh, fue uh, de mí en, en 1975, 76, en el Berkeley College of Music, cuando yo fui un freshman, uh, mi primer año en, en la escuela, tocando en una orquesta de un maestro, Michael Gibbs, the Michael Gibbs from Waterfall Orchestra. So anyway, David Carmona, during band the class, we get there a little early so I could play a little snare drum, David would be warming up on the trip, but one day I walk in early and he's there by himself. Me, me and him were the only ones interested in really being professional musicians. So he uh, has a catalog. It says Berkeley College of Music on the side. And it just has a close up of a person with a, holding a trumpet. And he's looking at it. I go, Dave, what's that? And he goes, man, this is the school day. Quincy Jones went to, Chick Corea uh, used to hang out at, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I go, really? He goes, yeah, man, this is the number one jazz school in the country. So I started looking at the catalog and I says, man, Dave, we got to go there. So our whole motivation was besides playing in these little pickup bands that we were playing at, these kitty salsa bands and wanting to learn really how to play jazz, etc. Our whole motivation was to get out of the hood and go study at the Berkeley College of Music in Boston. And Mr. Ryan overheard us talking, the band director in high school that I had. And he goes, you guys will never pass the audition. And we're looking at him and go, wow, we could play. Look, you know, we're already doing little gigs and this, that, and the other. He goes, you don't know enough theory. You don't know, you know what an Aeolian scale is? You know what harmonic, what a harmonic minor scale is? And we're looking at each other. No, he goes, listen, I'll make a deal with you. If you stay out of trouble, and staying out of trouble when you went to Catholic school meant not getting any uh, reprimands from any of the teachers and getting assigned to what was called jug, judgment under God. They put you in a room for an hour. You have to stand at attention like in the military and not make a sound. So you wasted an hour of your life if you, you were in there. If you guys stay out of jug, 
I'll teach you theory on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays after school. And that's what we did. And uh, we learned about all of these things we knew nothing, absolutely nothing about. Mr. Ryan did that for us. And because of him, I was able to pass not, the, not only the audition, the physical audition playing, but also the theory audition to get into the school. And I remember my audition was by Gary Burton, the great legendary vibrist. And when I was nominated for the Grammy, uh, uh, years later, one of the, uh, my first Grammy nomination with my own band, he was, I was competing against him. And he saw me in the hallway at, uh, at the uh, Grammy ceremonies and he stops me, hey, Roberto, <laughs> I guess we did a good thing by letting you into the school. You know, so uh, so th that picture that you saw of me was from 1975, 76. I was a freshman at the school, skinny, as you saw there. And because Michael Gibbs was the composer in residence at the school, which was a high, high position, Michael Gibbs was the arranger for <clears throat> John McLaughlin and the Mahavishnu Orchestra, a great, incredible fusion group from the 1970s. He wrote all the arrangements for the band when they recorded with the London Philharmonic. So he was invited to be the composer in residence at the school, and he had the most revered ensemble at the school. It was made up of teachers and the highest level of students. So he needed a percussionist for the band because he had seen Weather Report and with Alex Acuna, who was an early LP endorser, Manolo Badrena, another ex-LP endorser early on. And he was enamored with the fact of having Afro-Cuban percussion in this orchestra. So <clears throat> he was looking for somebody and between the teachers and the students, they all told him, you got to get Roberto Sanabria. He knows how to play those instruments. In fact, I was the only one that knew how to play those instruments at the, in the school at the time. When I was at Berkeley, nobody even knew what a New Yorican was. Nobody knew who Machito was. Nobody knew who Tito Puente was. Can you believe that? Nobody knowing who Tito Puente was at the Berkeley College of Music. I remember my freshman year, the, my roommate's looking at my albums, and he's going, who's Tipica 73? Who is Charanga 76? What is this? Uh, I said, well, it's Cuban music with flute and violins. Flute and violins and Cuban music, you know? Uh, you mean like La Cucaracha? And I go, no, man, no. He goes, who's Tito Puente, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it was like ridiculous, the level of ignorance of our culture at the time. So that's where I began to be an advocate for the culture and for the music in my own little way because people would knock on my door, on my dorm room door. Are you the guy with the Latin records? I go, yeah, can I borrow some, man? I go, you can't borrow them, but you can come in and we could listen. Or I can't do it right now. I have a, a few classes, come back around seven o'clock or right after dinner or whatever. And they come and we sit there. And in my own primitive way, I try to explain to them what's happening. This is the sound of the timbales. You hear that uh, tapping? That's the sound of what we call the cascada, the side of the shell. The conga drum is keeping the basic, what we call tumbao, the basic fundamental rhythmic pulse, repetitive rhythms along with the bass and the piano, et cetera, et cetera. I had very little knowledge really of the music at the time, but I had one thing going for me. <clears throat> I was very curious, very inquisitive, and I was very proud of my culture. And at the time when I was growing up in New York City, there was a gentleman by the name of Felipe Luciano who had a radio show on Sundays called Latin Roots. This is when I was in grammar school, okay? And every Sunday afternoon, he played the music on the, the then number one jazz station in New York, WRVR, and he'd explain what's going on. That's when I found out that Arsenio Rodriguez was the most important figure in the history of Afro-Cuban based dance music. And that's how I found out that without Arsenio from Cuba, we wouldn't have a conga drum in dance bands, okay? He was the first one to adapt and adopt the conga drum and make it a permanent part of dance orchestras in Cuba. He was the one that replaced the guitar playing song, which is the fundamental uh, building block of what we call salsa today. Song, the folk song tradition of Eastern Cuba. He, they used to just use guitar 
and the mandolin like sounding dress, a guitar with three sets of double strings. He puts the piano in to uh, replace the sound of the guitar. Lili Martinez, he's ground zero as far as salsa piano playing is concerned. I found out all of those things through listening to Felipe Luciano, and he'd have guests like Tito Puente on, like Eddie Palmieri on, like the great uh, historian, uh, musicologist, Rene Lopez. All of these people, like Ed, Maestro Eddie Palmieri, Maestro Puente, I got to perform with, record with, and they became my friends. Maestro Puente, may you rest in peace. Maestro Rene Lopez, good friend, never did it in my wildest imagination that I think when I was a, a kid growing up in the South Bronx, listening to these people on the radio, that not only would I become uh, their friends, but I get to perform with them as well. So I had that basic knowledge when I was, went into the Berkeley College of Music. So I became kind of like the go-to guy at the school to learn about this music. Okay. And in the Michael Gibbs Crumb Waterfall Orchestra, since that orchestra was the primo ensemble at the school, we used to rehearse in a room called E1. Anybody but knows about the Berkeley College of Music knows E1. It's a big room. I don't know if it's still there. Ensemble Room 1. We used to rehearse there, I believe, on Monday nights. Everybody used to be there at the door. Sometimes Michael Gibbs would let the door open and there'll be a crowd of like 30 or 40 people there watching what we were doing. And what we were, what were we doing? We were playing all this advanced music in odd meters, like in seven, 11, uh, nine, 17, etc. cetera. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know anything about music, when I'm counting out, you could count out one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, what I'm uh, tapping. You could you could count it out like that. You could count it out like this. One, two, one, two. You could count it by threes. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. So Glavit generates all of those meters. That's why it makes you move and groove. That's the science behind it. But Michael Gibbs was experimenting with what we call odd meters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six. You notice how nothing is hitting with this except when it cycles around eventually. So he would put up a sheet of music in front of you and it would say it would have a bar of seven, a bar of 11 and a bar of, say, uh, uh, four. And he'd go, Roberto, can you make up a rhythm? for that cadence, that three bar cadence. And I'd look at it and I go, sure, I could do it. And the reason I could do it was because my my brain functioned that way. I could, I could uh, instantaneously uh, understand where the main stress points would have to be. And also I had been exposed to a great musician by the name of Don Ellis. La razón que yo pude uh, uh, tocar en esas medidas compuestas que Michael Gibbs estaba experimentando con fue porque yo, uh, yo era un fanático en, en esos días en la escuela superior de un señor que se llamaba Dan Ellis, el músico más progresista en la historia de jazz. The reason I could uh, do that was because I was a fan of Dan Ellis, the most progressive musician that has ever lived in the history of jazz. I saw him on TV on PBS with this incredible big band that had strings. He had his trumpet electrified. He had all the brass electrified. He had wah-wah pedals hooked up to amps for the trumpets to be able to play like if they were Jimi Hendrix on the guitar, et cetera, et cetera. And he experimented a lot with these odd meters because he was a student of different cultures from all over the world. Little did I know that he had played in salsa bands in Los Angeles as well when I found out, I found that out through Rudy Calzado, the then singer of the Mario Baza Afro-Cuban Jazz Orchestra, who I, I would play drums with years later, Mario Baza, the father of Afro-Cuban Jazz, the co-founder of the Machito Afro-Cubans. He was the musical director of that band I mentioned. Rudy used to play in a salsa band in California with Don Ellis as the trumpet player, he goes to me one day, oye, tú me das recuerdo de un loco que yo tocaba, que yo cantaba con la, en una orquesta en Los Ángeles, y había un trompetista, 
bien loco, <laughs> que se llamaba, uh, and before I could, he could uh, say who it was, he was telling me, you remind me of a guy that uh, used to play with in a band in LA, trumpet player, crazy dude. His name was, and I said, and I, before I, he could go on, I said, Don Ellis, he goes, ese el tipo, that's the guy. He go, Rudy tells me, yeah, he used to ask me questions like, how do you play the Guido in 7-4? He goes, listen, and, and I go to Rudy, what did you tell him? I said, listen, I don't know how to play it in 7-4, but I'll show you how to play it in 4-4, and you can figure it out. So anyway, uh, I was a fan of Don Ellis, and when Michael Gibbs handed me that music, I, it was very simple for me. I said, I understand what you want, you know, and... In that band was just faculty members of the school. So one of the faculty members was a guitar player, had a big head of hair, and he had a lumberjack shirt. And for the first two weeks of rehearsals, and remember, these rehearsals are being watched. It was like a thing. It was like a happening. On Monday nights, like 30 or 40, 50 people would be hanging out in that hallway with the door open, watching us rehearse with this big band that had also strings, just like Don Ellis, with the, doing all this experimental music. And I have to provide all these odd meter tumbaos for the music. But also I was playing timbales, Brazilian percussion. I was a big fan of Brazilian music through Ayerto that I had been exposed to when I was young as well by listening to his music on WRVR and watching him on TV, on PBS as well. So... Um, I was in the thick of things, and the guitar player, for the first two weeks, he was very quiet, didn't say anything. I said hello to him when I sat down. The third week, he was there. Then finally, the fourth week, he wasn't there. The fifth week, he wasn't there. There was another guitar player. Finally, I asked, turned to Kermit Driscoll, the bass player, hey, whatever happened to that guitar player with the big hair and the lumberjack shirt? And he goes, that guitar player, man? That was Pat Metheny, man. He's on a world tour. He just got signed to ECM. You didn't know that was Pat Metheny? I go, oh, man. You know, in my ignorance, being a newbie, I didn't know. And who was the guitar player that took his place? Those of you who are fans of jazz guitar, fellow student along with me at Berkeley at the time, Bill Frizzell. So that was the environment. All of a sudden, from the South Bronx, playing timbales, in local salsa bands, etc., but wanting, craving to learn how to play jazz and being influenced by jazz as we all were as Latin musicians. Now I'm in the think of things at the Berklee College of Music. But then in my second year, something momentous happened. I was taking drum lessons, right? And I was frustrated because the teachers I had, I'm not going to mention them, they just weren't giving me the basic mechanics that I needed of what we call coordinated independence to be able to play the drum set in a jazz context. And finally, somebody in the lunchroom in the cafeteria says, you got to study with Keith Copeland, man. He's like you. He's from New York City. He's African-American. So anyway, I go to the office. They say, oh, he's booked up for the next two years. He goes, I got to study with him. If I don't study with him, I'm going to commit suicide. They go, wait a minute, Sinabria, hold on. <laughs> of course, I was just kidding. But the woman was very nice. Here, here's his phone number. And also, walk around the school. Maybe you can find him. That day, I'm walking around, I always remember, on Boylston Street, uh, I bump into him near the Berkeley College of Music. Mr. Copeland, Mr. Copeland, my name is Roberto Sanabria. I got to study with you. Hold on, hold on. I know who you are. I heard about you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So to make a long story, says Shorty goes, let me see what I can do. And uh, the next day in my mailbox, I said, you are now the student of Keith Copeland. I go, wow, finally. I go to my first lesson. He goes, okay, Roberto, sit down behind the drums and play for me. So at that time, all the drum teachers, they just basically had one drum set in the room. In the, uh, It's very common now for a drum teacher to have two drum sets. So I sit down and I play some funk for him, some basic funk that people, you know, would today call a hip hop beat or whatever. He goes, but before I did that, he said hi. So I took the seat and started turning it. And he goes, hold it, hold it, hold it. What the F are you doing? He literally said that. What the F are you doing? I said, what the F am I doing? I'm from New York. I'm like, you know, so I go, what the F am I doing? The seat is too effing high, man. I'm lowering it. Okay. So right away, you know, we're in the, a New York state of mind. That's just the way we talk in New York City. So real, the real deal. Just that's it, Neil. If you can't deal with it, 
Anyway, so he is, I mean, listen, man. If you are playing somebody's drum set, it's like you're visiting somebody's house. How would you like it if I visited your house and I started moving around the furniture in the living room because I didn't like the way it was set up? He goes, the drum set is my house. You're visiting my house. So don't touch anything. Don't move anything. Sit down. Shut up. And play the effing drums for me. And in my head, I go, man, I finally got the right, right drum teacher. And I always tell that story because that is the best lesson I have ever had in my life. And God bless Keith because he taught me coordinated independence. He taught me how to read charts, etc., to read fly stuff. Got my hands together, my feet together. Just ridiculous. And he did that not only for me but for thousands of other drummers out there. And I encourage you, all of you, especially those of you who are LP artists or artists with other companies, because I endorse other companies as well, uh, to mention the people that made you cross that Rubicon. And for me, it was three people, my father uh, and my mother, uh, Keith, and my high school band director, uh, Mr. Ryan. And let me tell you something about my mom. When I told my father that I wanted to go to study co in college and leave New York City, my father was a working class guy. He was a machinist, man. It took him two hours to go to Long Island from the South Bronx and two hours to come back. He worked in Valley Stream, Long Island. Two hours to get there, two hours to come back. When he came home from work, he'd sit in a lazy boy chair <clears throat> He, he would smoke cigarettes. Then to wean himself off cigarettes, he smokes cigars. He finally weaned himself off that. he drink a can of Schaefer beer, the worst beer in the world. Sit there in that lazy boy and listen to music. My mother used to tell me, Siéntate al lado de tu papá y a la tarea tuya ahí al lado de So I'd do my homework next to him, and I'd listen to what he listened to. And he'd be listening to Harry Belafonte live at Carnegie Hall. He'd be listening to... Machito, live at the Crescendo. He'd li be listening to Maestro Tito Puente. He'd be listening to the Count Basie Orchestra. He's the one that bought Sex Machine on a 45 because he liked the song. I couldn't believe it when he bought that. He bought. He was into Motown. He was into everything. My father was super cosmopolitan, super into history. I got my love of history from him. He was my first teacher. But when I told him I wanted to go to school, leave New York City, he started trying to talk me out of it in Spanish. And uh, to, at that time, I don't know if this, it's the same now, if you're a minor, like 17, you, your parents have to sign a permission uh, paper for the college that you're going to that gives, you per, gives them permission, let them know, yeah, we're his parents and we allow him to leave the confines of New York to study in Boston. My father said, no. He said, stay here in New York. You can study here in New York. And you can, you know, uh, still do what you're doing, playing your little salsa gigs, what you're doing, et cetera. And you can have something to fall back on just in case. And I go, no, I want to learn how to play jazz. I want to leave New York City. The projects, I'm going to die here. Something's going to happen to me. There's nothing for me here. I got to leave. My mother's looking at him and she tells him in Spanish, mira, si tú no firmas los papeles para ir a estudiar en la universidad, música, te voy a divorciar. She tells him, if you don't sign the papers for him to go to college, to study, I'm going to divorce you. And she was serious. My father signed the papers in less than a minute. And that's how I got to the Berkeley College of Music. And that's how I got to Keith Copeland. And the rest is history. I've had a long storied career. When I left uh, the Berkeley College of Music, the first gig that I got was with this gentleman, that you're going to see in the next slide, Mongo Santa Maria. Okay, this is a picture of me with him in 1982. I'm still playing the timbales, but you see on the side that there's a drum set. So you had to have a very specific skill set to play with Mongo Santa Maria, one of the most famous congueros in the history of the music. You had to be able to play legitimate drum set, not just jive, play some hip hop beat or whatever, but really play and play authentic Cuban style timbales because we would do funk tunes, etc., with that those kind of feels, and then obviously play jazz mambos, cha cha chas, guamancos, etc. Also, what I'm proud about with Mongo Santa Maria, we were the we were probably the first band in the United States to record in the the songo 
uh, feel, which is a uh, song was a contraction of two words, song plus guaguanco, was a style developed in 1968-69 by a band called uh, Juan Formen y los Bamban in Cuba. And uh, Juan Formen is the real guy that developed the style. Everybody gives Jose Luis Quintana Changuito the credit, but it wasn't him. He helped to advance the style with his creations on the drum set, but it was really Juan Formel that developed. So it's a fusion of elements of R&B, because he and Juan Formel's heroes were the Beatles. He was very influenced by them in their terms of their songwriting, but also a lot of elements of the song and the rumba tradition fused together, hence the word songo. So we were one of the first, and the drum set is prominent, you can play it on the theme balls, but really the drum set is prominent. And we were one of the first bands to do that type of field here in the United States <clears throat> on, on a recording. There had been bands that had been doing it in the salsa world, but they weren't using drum set. They were doing it on the theme balls, like Tipica 73 with Orestes Vilato, another former LP artist. But uh, in terms of the drum set, I believe we were the first ones. There's an album called Mongo Magic, and there's a song called Piranha by Marty Shella, and you can hear that feel on the uh, on that recording. And you can you know hear it on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. So let's look at the next picture. This is my first solo album, New York City Ache. People laugh and look at it, they say ache. But if you know anything about Spanish, you know that you don't put accents on capital letters, okay? And that was spray painted on a wall on 12th Avenue, where a gas station is now, uh, 12th Avenue and 14th Street. So uh, I was with a photographer, and he he said, "Why don't you just spray paint the the wall?" You know, because uh, I was going to spray paint it small letters to <clears throat> not to cause any alarm. He goes, "Man, spray paint it big, man. Do it graffiti style." I remember the the. Uh, the photographer was Cuban. Forgot his name. But anyway, uh, and that's me with the Shekere and a Kufi hat, etc. And that with that album, I became very well known. Besides becoming well known with Mongo Santa Maria. Then after Mongo Santa Maria, I started playing with uh Luis Peri Cortiz, the great uh Puerto Rican trumpeter. We did an album called Breaking the Rules, which was the first recording done with 48 tracks in the Latin field. And again, I in that and there's a song, song called Como Vivo Yo that he had recorded before, but I we re-recorded it with a new arrangement by Oscar Hernandez. I'm sorry, Perico did the arrangement. Incredible trumpet player from Puerto Rico, incredible composer, arranger. And he featured me on that piece. I do a solo on the drum set. At the time, believe it or not, I was using five, six, seven, eight cowbells. You say to yourself, eight cowboys. I had an apparatus on the side of the floor, Tom. I'm right handed that you could put mount five cowbells, and I had them in descending order of size large, next large, next smallest, next small. So a little small cha cha bell. Then I had a foot pedal tapping out so I could tap out rhythms with my left foot, like I'm doing now. And I used two cowbells on the drum set, and I was using a wood block as well but uh and i was using a jam block by that time the jam block had been invented okay so the apparatus that i that i used that five the five uh bells on i found it in a store i, I believe it was called drummer's world a gentleman by the name of barry greaseman had it and i said hey i want that so at that time, Ayerto was influencing all of us with multiple percussion, but I wanted to use that because I could play melodies on the bells, etc. If you are playing a basic rhythm on just one bell, go, 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 go. But if you have five bells, you could play go, go, ki, ki, go, 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 ki, 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 go, go, ki, 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 go, go, ki, 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 go, go, ki, et cetera, et cetera. Just as a, that's just a simple example of orchestrating melodically, right? So I, I must have been the only uh, LP artist at the time using that many cowbells on, on, on the drum set. And I remember that uh, Martin Cohen asked me, hey, can you write a little pamphlet on how to use cowbells and adapt and use them on the drum set? And that pamphlet is a collector's item. If you have it, cherish it because 
it was one of the forays that Martin first got into in terms of uh, providing educational material. He asked me to do it. Uh, there was no computers at the time. I wrote all the out all the musical notation, etc. Maybe you, some of you have that pamphlet. It's it opens up. It's uh, it's called How to Use Cabos on the Drum Set, I believe, and that came from that. So from Mongo Santa Maria, I go to Luis Pericortis. Then I go to the great Mario Balsa, the father of Afro-Cuban jazz, his incredible orchestra. With Mongo, I got to tour all over the Europe, all over the world. And at the time, I was doing, I was, I'm one of the last musicians to also be doing, uh, to have done uh, studio work at the time. I was always in the recording studio doing jingles, movie soundtracks, et cetera. Uh, at that time, I did the movie soundtrack to the... Uh, Mambo Kings, where I played drums and timbales on there. And uh, with Mario Baza, oh, forget it. I was like a kid in a candy factory because here we have a gentleman that played with Noble Sissel, Cap Calloway, uh, formed the Machido Orchestra with his brother-in-law in 1939, is the first to develop the concept of Afro-Cuban jazz, the first form of Latin jazz. He brought Dizzy Gillespie to the Cap Calloway band and exposed him to Afro-Cuban rhythms. And Dizzy later would record Manteca, who people think that's that's first Afro-Cuban Latin jazz number, but it's not. It's the Machiro Afro-Cubans, a song called Tanga, that was is accredited to Mario Balzaf in 1943. So uh, with Mario, I'm just constantly asking him questions, and he would call me. My nickname in the band from him was Maquejode, the guy that bugs you the most, as we would say in Spanish. El, 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 el apodo mío en la orquesta de Mario Balsa fue Maquejode, porque yo siempre estaba preguntando, haciendo preguntas a él, a Rudy Calzado, a Patato. I was always asking Rudy Calzado, the singer, who was also a fine arranger and composer in his own right, about the questions. That's how I found out about Donald's. Patato was playing congas in the band, another great LP artist asking him questions in the band. I was basically the youngest guy in the band. So I was very fortunate. I was always the youngest guy in the bands that I played in, uh, in terms of name artists. And because of that, I was able to ask questions. And people were, some people were taken aback. You're really interested in this kid? I go, of course. I, I, I was very curious because I had gotten this love of history from my father. Okay. And I've had a story career. Let's look at the next slide coming to the end. we This is me with my Multiverse Big Band. All of my Big Band albums have been nominated for Grammys, uh, eight in total. Another, uh, this is the first Big Band album we did in 2000, Live and Enclave, Grammy nominated. This is my Cuarteto Ache, which is one of my other groups where I get to play in a small group jazz context. Next slide. This is Big Band over in Folk Tales from 2007, another Grammy nominated album with my 21 piece big band. This is the Manhattan School of Music Afro-Cuban Jazz Orchestra. I taught the orchestra for 20 years at the Manhattan School of Music. Uh, three years ago, I, I quit the school. And uh, with that band, that was nominated for a Latin Grammy. That was with my students. We recreated the entire Kenya album by the Machito Afro-Cubans. That was recorded in 1958. And for the 50th anniversary, we had Candido on uh, the album to celebrate the 50th anniversary because he played on the original album. Let's go to the next slide real quick. Another album, Tito Puente Masterworks Live. I uh, recreated some of the uh, incredible big band music, uh, his, the serious compositions that Maestro Puente wrote for big band with new arrangements. And this was nominated for a Latin Grammy as well in 2011, all with my students. You want to hear about, learn about Tito Puente's music? Check out that album. This is uh, my big band, the Multiverse Big Band from 2012. And that was double Grammy nominated. Uh, as you can see, there's a, a through line here. <laughs> this is the my most recent work, the Multiverse Big Band. With, we did the whole entire score of West Side Story. It's called West Side Story Reimagined on two CDs. The money goes to the Jazz Foundation of America to help Puerto Rico, my ancestral homeland. And that was nominated for a Grammy as well. We didn't win again. But it won something more important, the Jazz Journalist Award Album of the Year, which means more to me than anything, because I meant the critics said it was the finest album of 2019. So there's a lot of other things that I've done in my career, but we'd have to be here for another couple of hours, and I'm sure you have questions. 
uh, and I'm going to bring Jerry Zacharias on here, who is the head of artist relations for LP, to uh, ask me some questions really quick. I don't we were supposed to go now, but I think we can go another extra 15 minutes. So it's no problem with me, Jerry, if it's all right with you. And I'm sure we have some great questions. No, perfect. Thank you so much, Bobby. Thank you again for doing this and for sharing your story with us. Some really cool stuff that you're talking about. And and I was like thinking about all the, you know, the experiences of growing up in the Bronx and all that. And and during that time, I'm pretty sure it was, it was very tumultuous, like you were saying, with, you know, Watergate, Vietnam and Civil oh, yeah. rights movement. Well, the, the main thing we were scared of is getting drafted. Yeah. Oh, wow. We were all scared. I'm talking because it was the first time that you had seen the effects of war on TV. It was like a ritual for all of us, all of us watch, to watch Walter Cronkite on the six, seven o'clock news, talking about and showing footage of people with their heads blown off, legs blown off, et cetera, et cetera. So we were very, very, very scared. We talked about it when I was in high school. We were, and then Watergate with the president, but look at what's going on right now. You know, so I never thought it would happen again, but it, it has, unfortunately. So uh, just goes to, again, that word resiliency and the people in the community, uh, I'm talking about people like Evelina Antonetti, who was the founder of United Bronx Parents, who, would, although she has an Italian last name, she was Puerto Rican, and she's the grandmother of Joe Conzo Jr., who is the, the uh, most famous photographer in hip hop, and he's also taken many photos alongside Martin at great salsa concerts and Latin jazz concerts. She told uh, in a big meeting of uh, politicians. They told her to shut up and sit down. She goes, no, you shut up and you listen because we're not leaving the South Bronx. This is our home. I've raised my kids here, my grandkids. This is our home. You can't take it away from us. We're not leaving. It shows you the resiliency, particularly of the Puerto Rican community. I must say as well, nobody gives the Puerto Rican community enough credit. We were the ones that opened the doors for every Latino community to come in into New York City. We took all the hard knocks. We were the ones that developed bilingual education in New York City, et cetera, et cetera. Fought for to, the creation of El Museo del Barrio, places like the New Yorkian Village and the New Yorkian Poets Cafe, et cetera. I can go on and on and on. And that was one of the reasons I did West Side Story Reimagined. So it was my love letter to the, it's my love letter to the Puerto Rican community of not only New York City, but also of, of the island as well, because we're sons and daughters of the island. That's oh, beautiful. You connected it. You know, you, you kind of merged everything together. And I think some of the proceeds went to Puerto Rico, too, for some of the uh, what they were going through as well. So I, that's, that's amazing stuff. Yeah. And the biggest honor for me was in 2019 being the name, the padrino, the godfather of the Puerto Rican Day Parade in New York City. There it is. Yeah. yeah. The National Puerto Rican Day Parade. That is the biggest parade in New York City. The national and it's national. Wow. So I, when they asked me, I thought it was, I thought they were joking, you know. But it's it's a it's a it's a good thing. It's a good it's a good thing to be honored by your hometown. I've also been honored by the Bronx. I I'm in the Bronx Walk of Fame. I think you have a picture there on the Grand Concourse. Yeah, there's a there's a wow. plaque with my name on it, alongside uh, uh, many other people. Like uh, who's the drummer for uh, Aerosmith? Joey Kramer. Oh, uh, Joey Kramer. Yeah, he's from the Bronx. He's on the oh, Bronx Book of Fame as well, you know. So uh, uh, it, it's always good to, to be honored by your 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 homies, the people that, oh. that brought forth your life. You know, of course, and that was and that was a way of life too. Like, I mean, you guys had rumors in the park. You were saying that, you know, you grew up. It would, you would hear rumors in the park. People would be playing, and that there's was no way there. you could escape it. No way yeah. you could escape it. No yeah. way you could escape it. But the hip thing was, like I said, can you imagine people playing at midnight rumba in the park like this? We need that. Oh, you know, and people singing. You're talking about not only people playing congas, but the junkies hanging out and everything. Sometimes the cops would stop, and instead of stopping you, they'd just look at you and he'd smile, et cetera, because most of the cops were African-American. And... Yeah. Latinos, Puerto Ricans particularly, and some white cops. Everybody the thing that killed that was when Rudy Giuliani became the mayor of New York. He started passing these quality of life ordinances 
and uh, he squelched that because what happened? Gentrification. You have people that are moving into these neighborhoods, in our neighborhoods that are outs outsiders, and all of a sudden they're hearing conga drums, which is part of our culture, yep. and they don't know that, and they they call up the cops. Hey, there are people playing Congo drums or whatever. You know, they don't like, even know the name. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the cops come and they would confiscate the drums and everything, and and sometimes break them. So you know that was because of Giuliani, and and at the, he doesn't realize that culture for us is our sustenance. We don't go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Nope. You have a fight with your wife, you put on a Tito Rodriguez record singing a beautiful bolero, and then she starts listening, she starts crying, and everything starts realizing that what you're arguing about is stupid, and all of a sudden you wind up making love with at least dancing together. And that was our sustenance for us as kids. Yeah. You know, and for the African American community, you take James Brown, he's singing I'm I'm black and I'm proud. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, you know, it was a tumultuous time. You have Malcolm X, you have uh, Martin Luther King, you have Bobby Kennedy, John Kennedy, uh Medgar Evers, all of these people got assassinated during when I was growing up. I remember the day John Kennedy got assassinated. I was in the first grade. I go up the elevator uh, in my projects. I cross, I uh, I make a left to go to, uh, go to half hallway down. Then I make another left to go to my hallway straight to my. And my mother opens the door before I get to the door, because she heard my footsteps and she's in tears, screaming at the top of her lungs. Mataron el presidente. Mataron el presidente. You know they killed the president because he was a hero to us because he gave a damn about our communities. Right. And then when Bobby Kennedy got assassinated. And that was reflected in the music of the time period. Music is always a reflection of the time period that uh, that it that it's that it's in. And you know, right now it's about a lot of bling and this, that, and the other. And you know, because uh, people are forgetting about what's really, really important. And for us, our culture is important. And I'm so glad that LP hasn't forgotten that because Martin, the only reason Martin founded this company was because of his love of the culture. Why would a guy that's an engineer, a budding engineer, uh, who graduated from City College and everything, is working at a good firm, all of a sudden say, you know something? F this. I'm going to make a better set of bongos because <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm in love with Afro-Cuban music. So right. there you go. Yeah, it's never been about just the uh, uh, the profit. It's always been about like, hey, let's. This is culture. This is a way of life. This is what people. This is a part of people's lives. This is this goes history in their humanity. So, um, we've had many great conversations about that, about the about how the music scene and culture and why it's important to know the history, not only just how to play and and learn how to play, but also about the history, the connection, the roots of it all. Right, right. It's important because uh, I could tell somebody that has some degree of depth in their playing just by the way they play. You know, yeah. <clears throat> you could tell that they learned some exercise out of some book or whatever. And so I must say, the level of percussion playing today and drum set playing is just phenomenal today, technically, you know, because we have more access to information. Where I had to go to study with Keith Copeland at the Berkeley College of Music and get that information. And also he would take me along to his gigs. Check this out. He used to take me and Terry Link Tarrington along to his oh. gigs. He would do these little master classes, clinics at public schools in the Boston area. He would take me and Terry along with him. Terry was 14 years old at the time. I was 18. And uh, we would play in trio form and watch him talk about the history of jazz drumming, the history, of, and then he would make the connections to uh, Africa and how Latin percussion is in keeping that tr those traditions alive in our music, etc. And he'd bring us up. And Terry was a budding fourteen-year-old uh, protege, so uh, so it was great. And uh, I reminded her that the last time I was at the Grammys, we had a big meeting of a conclave of people from the Berkeley College of Music, and she started smiling and go, yeah, remember that, man? Oh, man, I, I, I can't believe you remember that. But that's the way Keith was. Uh, you learn, by you have to be actually in the moment. He'd take me to his gigs. 
in Boston, and he started recommending me for gigs. I was so proud. He recommended me to a gig one time in Roxbury, which is the black enclave of Boston, to sub for him with this band. He says, just do what the band leader says. Don't give him no guff or anything. Just do exactly what he says, and uh, you'll be cool. You're from New York. You'll be cool. So I get there. Everybody there in the place is African-American. First thing out of their mouth, they go, you Italian? I go, no, man, I'm Puerto Rican from New York, from the Bronx. He goes, oh, okay, cool. Come on in, you know? So I set up. The band leader looks at me. You Italian? Keith sent you? He goes, I go, no, man, I'm Puerto Rican. <laughs> you know, because of what I look like, my phenotype, what I look like. So that's cool. So he goes to me, listen, man, we're playing for dancers. So four on the floor. Yeah. No bebop drumming or whatever. So yeah. Don't drop no bombs or anything. We're gonna be playing a lot of Count Basie music. This and I go, I got you. I got exactly what you and the best thing that you want from a band leader is after uh, during the first tune, then turning around, smiling and giving you the thumbs up or whatever, and the rest of the band doing that. So Keith had that kind of kind of confidence in me. He, he sent me to those kind of gigs. You know? Wow. Incredible. There used to be a place called the Sugar Shack in Boston. Yeah. So I have never seen James Brown live. So oh, it's wow. a black, totally black club, totally. So I'm online, what I look like, everybody's African-American on the line. So, you know, I start uh, making a conversation with people, you know, and they, I'm from New York and, you know, this, that, and the other. And they go, I'm um, Puerto Rican. They go, oh yeah, I got family in New York. This, I get to the front of the line. So he goes, hey, hold up. He goes, what are you doing here? You know, because of my color skin. And I go, man, I'm here to see the Godfather. Right? The guy goes, right on, come right in. You know? <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, yeah. so I mean, I, I could tell you man, so many, so, so many things that I've experienced in my life. Nice wow. stories like that, but also some ugly things too. That no, uh, man, you're gonna have to sense. wait till to I read my memoirs for that one. But uh, thank you wow. so much for the opportunity for letting me share. Does Does anybody have any questions out there? You can. Yeah, we can take a few chat. questions from uh, from from our audience here. Uh, let's see if anybody has anything here. We got some really good comments here. Everybody really. Really saying hello from everywhere, all over the place. Some anti nights. Aaron Knights has seen Mongo was the funkiest thing. He indeed was because what happened with Mongo was he had recorded Watermelon Man, I think back in 1962, 63. And the original recording is the one you want to get. The one on Battle Records. That one. If you find it on YouTube, play the one that's on Battle Records. That one. The original 45. Then he got signed to Columbia, and they redid it. But the one on battle is the funkiest version. Wow. Okay? Yeah, so it's a tune by Herbie Hancock. It's not a 12-bar blues. It's a 16-bar blues. It's a little odd in that sense. But it's the sound of Herbie Hancock remembering when he saw the watermelon man with the cart coming down the street on the cobblestone in Chicago. So I always tell my students, your life – you will draw upon your life experiences as a composer, arranger, and as a player. So that tune, Herbie was playing piano at the time with Mongo Santa Maria in the South Bronx. Can you believe that Herbie Hancock used to take the subway to, and he lived in the Morrisenia section of the South Bronx? Just amazing, you know? Uh, and he used to play at a club called the 845, which was the main jazz club in the South Bronx at the time. Everybody played there. Chick Corea played there. Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, Miles Davis. As I said before, the Bronx at one time had Incredible. as many or more nightclubs than Manhattan, but that all ended with the fires. So when Herbie played that song for Mongo and he started playing the tumbao of Cha Cha Cha, some Montuno to it, it felt like a glove. And, you know, it's basically a Guajira Cha Cha Cha, some Montuno with that funky, uh, with the funky rhythm of uh, the piano, but also the timbales conga and guido but the first version in my opinion is the one on battle records not the one on columbia get the first original one and that's how he got signed because that song became such a hit 
uh, Jack Hook, his manager at the time, we got to get you signed to a big label. And that's what happened. And the rest is uh, history. Unfortunately, because of that hit, Mongo was always trying to get another hit record. And uh, uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen again. But it opened the doors for him to play at all the jazz festivals and, and everything else. And Mongo was a symbol for African-Americans of Africa, for, for many of them for their reconnection to Africa. And for us, man, when I was in Mongo, man, you got to understand, man, this is the culture, you know? It's always about culture, not about color. Color is what racists or people that have a problem always deal with. It's about culture. Somebody's going to me, how could you play Cuban music, Bobby? The way you're Puerto Rican and you're light skinned from New York City and this, that. Because I grew up with that, man. That's what I grew up with. How could you play funk and jazz? I grew up with black culture in New York City, man. And, and the way our Mexican American brothers and sisters grew up with it in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Oakland, etc. You know, come on. So I'm with Mongo. And we're talking about Santeria and this, that, because Mongo was a child of Chango in Santeria, which is the religion based off of Ifa, which is the original religion of the Yoruba people in Nigeria that was brought to Cuba during the colonial period. And we're talking about, you know, I'm a child of Obatala, the uh, deity of creativity, the oldest Orisha super being. He's a child of Chango. And we're talking about different songs and this, that, and the other, and, and this, that, and, uh, you know, people are looking at us going, how are these guys talking about all this stuff? And, you know, I, I, and I have to turn to them and say, man, because it's our culture, you know, it's our collective experience. Of course, I would always defer to Mongo because he's an elder. One of the things I've learned, and I hope hopefully my students have learned it and anybody watching this is that you must have respect for those that have come before, your elders. You might think that your grandfather is not hip because he doesn't know anything about an iPhone or a smartphone or about how to do an email on a computer, but he's experienced things that you will never, ever, ever experience. And I learned that the hard way uh, uh, with my father as the years would go by. And finally, when he passed away about five years ago, I had no idea all of the things that he had gone through to provide for me and my sister. A lot of them uh, uh, experience that he had with racism and my mother had experience in New York City uh, through uh, racism, the, the experience, the common experience of racism. You get a touch of that if you look at West Side Story, the musical. That's um, important. Yeah. And uh, people have to remember, West Side Story is about the New York Puerto Rican experience. It's not about the Puerto Rican experience on the island. A lot of island Ricans look at West Side Story and say, ah, they portray us as gang members. Man, what right. the hell do you think we had to do to survive New York City? We had to be in gangs. But if you notice in West Side Story, the musical, the Puerto Ricans all speak in complete sentences, perfect English. They're always dressed well, always perfectly coiffed, the whole thing. Yeah. There's a lot oh, of yeah. inside things. There's an article that I wrote about that. I'll share it with you, Jerry, and then anybody yes. that wants to uh, get that article, they can write to Jerry at LP and I'll Jerry will forward it to you. Thank you. Wow, that's it, it, that that's exactly, you know, I was I was uh I was even talk, I was talking to a lot of the guys in the East Coast too, but they, you know, the, the whole experience of of also just uh uh in general going to the clubs, seeing how music is is everywhere. You go down to the clubs, you go underneath and you know, that that whole experience which I can't wait so that all comes back. I'm hoping this, this doesn't last a long time. Uh, but uh, let's quickly talk about uh, Gandhi, though, because I know, you know, he talk about a mentor, talk about a, a pioneer and an elder, um, and a, a very respected one. Uh, you were sharing a lot of uh, a lot of information when he recently passed away. And, and I think I, I know you attended his, his service as well. Right. But quickly, let's let's just quickly go over Gandhi, though, and I'd love to uh, uh, maybe you could share with uh, the people on on your, your personal experiences with him as well. Well, I met Candido in 1980, starting to play with a gentleman by the name of Marco Riso, a great pianist who was a protege of Ernesto Lacoana, Cuba's greatest pianist and composer. And uh, Marco came in 1940 to New York City on a full scholarship to the Juilliard School. He was from Santiago, Cuba. 
which is the main city on the east coast of the island. You got to understand Cuba is separated by a cordillera, a mountain range. And the east is completely different than the west, Havana, Matanzas, etc. In the east is where the song was born, the folk song tradition, what we call salsa today, was born. Marco came from there, came to New York, and he started making a name for himself. And after his graduation from Juilliard, he went to Hollywood and started studying composition with Igor Stravinsky, believe it or not. And one of his classmates at UCLA was uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber, the great Broadway uh, composer. But anyway, Marco started becoming, uh, he started writing music for Republic Pictures. Uh, then he became the musical director for Bob Hope. And then he became the musical director for uh, Desi Arnaz for the I Love Lucy show. So if you see the old I Love Lucy show reruns, when you ever they have a rehearsal and you see the pianist, that's Marco. So prodigious technique, incredible. In 1980, he had a band that would play every Wednesday night in the plaza of the World Trade Center. Not Wednesday night, Wednesday afternoon for lunchtime. I had just graduated Berkeley, et cetera. Victor Venegas, the great bass player who was part of Mongo Santa Maria's original band, I was teaching at the Johnny Cologne East Harlem School of Music at the time. Victor saw me, was impressed. And uh, he goes to me, hey, man, I've been trying to reach you. You know, I didn't have an answering machine at the time. What I go, you're blowing a gig. I've been recommending you to this guy, Marco Rizzo. Here's his number. Call. I call him up. Marco says, I want to meet you. I meet him the day before the gig. He shows me the music. I go, Marco, I could, maestro. I was a little cocky at the time. I started laughing. I said, Marco, maestro, I can uh, I can sight read this. It's no problem. He goes, all right. I just want to make sure. Because they had a drummer before, but he couldn't play drum set, really. He, played, he was a timbala player. And uh, great timbala player. I'm not going to mention who it is because I respect him highly. But he needed somebody that really knew the ma la mecanica, how to really play that instrument, the drums, in a big band context. And Victor knew I was the guy to do it. So the first day I go, I take a checker cab. I didn't have a car. I was living in Sunnyside, Queens at the time with my then wife, Evita. And uh, we lived on the fourth floor. I remember having to bring the drums down four flights of steps, waiting to get a cab. On the, I had to wait to get a cab, just wait till cabs work. I got, luckily, I got a checker. Checker cabs were made in Chicago, big, huge cabs. Anybody can look them up online. They were great because eight people could fit in the cab. Okay, <laughs> literally. Wow. Uh, so they, so I get in. I put the drums in the back seat. I get there. I start setting up the drums, and from far away on the plaza, I see somebody coming towards me, walking, pushing something. Gets closer. Who is it? I go, holy sheesh! It's Candido, <laughs> pushing three congas on an apparatus. That three conga cradle hadn't been invented by, El or not invented, but made by LP yet, you know. So, uh, anyway, the uh, I, I, I'm in shock, literally, you know. Mm -hmm. So I play, and the band, then I start seeing the the people that are starting to come into band. Jerry Dodgen, who is uh, the lead alto player for the uh, Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra. Ronnie Cuba, the baddest baritone saxophone player on the planet. He's part of the Saturday Night Live band. Uh, it, uh, Barry Rogers, the guy that invented the New York City power trombone salsa sound. I mean, this was a band of all studio all stars. It was ridiculous. And that's how I met Candido. And the first tune, Jerry Dodgen smiles, turns around, and he goes, he just he whispers to me, he goes, yeah, sounds good with a real drummer, you know. <laughs> so, so, what? Yeah. I, you know, I mean, but I was I, I, in one gig. I had met the whole New York studio elite. Mauricio Smith was the other tenor, was one of the tenor saxophone players. Incredible virtuosic flautist. He was the original tenor player on Saturday Night Live. He goes to me, "Hey kid, I'm packing up. You do studio work?" And I go. Yeah. <laughs> the only studio work I had done was the work I, at, in Boston at the school and a few re local recordings over there. So I be at NOLA Recording Studios. We start at 9 in the morning, get there by 8.30, bring timbales. You're going to be playing drums and timbales, 
right? You play timbales too. I could tell you play timbales by the way you play on the drum set. So he goes, yeah, I'll be there. So I get, this time I took the subway instead of getting a cab. So I get there to NOLA. NOLA's a very famous studio on West 57th Street. It no longer exists. Charlie Parker recorded there. Everybody, many wow. movie soundtracks. Every, wow. When you walk into the studio, they had a full set of four timpani, vibes, marimba, xylophone, because they did so much studio work, they didn't want to rent the stuff, so they bought it. So, because they did a lot of movie soundtracks too. So I walk in there, there's a lone person behind the music stand, the big conductor stand. I come in, I make a racket with the timbas. The person turns around, it's Chico Faro, Maestro Chico O'Faro. Who, in case you, those of you watching don't know, he's the legendary composer, arranger, arranged for the Count Basie Orchestra, the first person to arrange orchestral things for the Machido Orchestra, work with Charlie Parker, Zutzen, everybody. So I go, I go, the first word out of my mouth was Maestro. He goes, Hi, oh. You must be Bobby, you know. Uh, you know, welcome, welcome. Mauricio told me a lot about you, you know. And so I goes, yes, yeah, set up right over there. The engineer comes over. There's the drum set, you know. And the drum sets in those days had those freaking uh, hydraulic heads. Everybody was that into that dead drum sound. Yeah. The, the snare drum had more tape on it than you can imagine, man. I mean, I started taking off the tape, off the snare drum because I hated that sound. And the guy goes to me. Don't change the sound because we record here every day and everybody, you know, we got it all set up. I go, can we get a little bit of resonance out of the snare drum? Okay, you know, so he, he, right. accelerate. Those were the days I call them fat wallet days because you know how they would tell you, can you put your fat, your your wallet on top of the snare and deaden it? Yeah. Because <laughs> what happened was in those days, people asked me about it. What happened was they had developed microphones instead of using expensive ribbon mics that heard like the human ear that would vibrate like the human eardrum. They had these uh, cardioid mics that you had to get them really close to the instruments wow. to record. And with drums, because you could get them close to each time, and it, that way you could mix each time instead of having an ambient sound and things like that. So they got into that and it led to, you could always tell those recordings from those days by, li uh, by listening to the drum sound. So anyway, who starts walking in? Ronnie Cooper, Jerry Dodgen, Spanky Davis, another famous, incredible lead trumpet player. Um, um, I mean, it was ridiculous. It was basically the, the Saturday Night Live band with a bunch of other great guys from the New York City, uh, City Studios. I remember Ronnie Cooper walks in with the baritone sax. And Ronnie used to be an ex-drug uh, uh, abuser, junkie, but he always still, he still talks like that. I love him. He goes, hey, man. <laughs> like to scare me with it. Hey, man. And then he real low. You look familiar. You know? <laughs> 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 so, and then he went. And then, you know. <laughs> so, that's how I started doing studio work. Wow. Uh, but Mauricio was the key because Mauricio was Panamanian, even though his last name was Smith. He was like Billy Cobble. Billy Cobble was Panamanian but he has an English surname, like many Panamanians do. And Mauricio, because he was such a bad mother flower, they got him to contract things. And anytime he had an opportunity, he would call up a Latino hmm. to get us into the studio. I don't know if you remember or anybody knows, but there were two Latinos in the original Saturday Night Live band. Mauricio on tenor saxophone, soprano, and flute. Ma master flute player, and he played harmonica too. He's the one that did the harmonica solos for Dan Aykroyd. Oh, wow. Dan Aykroyd was faking the funk while Mauricio was backstage doing so it. So he out. was playing the harmonica yeah. behind the curtain. Or and the then yeah. the other person was Rogelio Terran, who was Panamanian also. He was the percussionist. He was a graduate of Juilliard. He could play marimba, timpani, and everything. Yeah. And uh, But he also played congas and timbales, et cetera, et cetera. There were two Latinos yeah. on the uh, original Saturday Night Live band. Now there's none. Now, th yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> we, we need to bring that back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, amazing musician from Panama. It, it, yeah, it, yeah, Mauricio. Yeah. You didn't, man, you did not play with Mauricio. Yeah. Wow. A lot of people didn't like him because he called you out in the studio. Yeah. He said things like, you make a mistake, he goes, man, can't you read? Yeah. Well, Just like that. <laughs> 
And guys like Ronnie would start laughing. We would uh, be laughing, you know, or whatever. But that's just the way he was. He was like a perfection. And time is money in the studio. Of course, a lot of people have Pro Tool studios now. They could do take as much time as they want. But in those days, you had to you had to come to play, because you only had 15 minutes to get sound level and do maybe two jingles, like a. a a 30 second in those days it was 30 seconds and 60 seconds the jingles 30 seconds was radio 60 was tv mm. then they cut it down to 15 and 30 and now that's the commercials are like five seconds sometimes 10 seconds but it was time is money and money is time you did the rhythm section first with some of the horns with the horns and or rhythm section and then the horns would come in and then they start doing the vocals and they wanted more time with the vocals because the vocals are what sell the commercial and the producers wanted more time. Yeah. And, some, and, I, and I learned a lot about the politics of the studio too. One time I'm coming in to a studio, to the studio, and we were gonna do what we call a charanga style commercial. Charanga is a Cuban band with flute and violins. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are musicians and are percussionists, you know that you play on the timbal as a small little bell like a cha-cha bell and the guido, you know, go, go, and then, and I'm playing the clave of song now so you can hear what that sounds like. It's a particular style of uh, rhythm. I'll go back to the rumba clave. And this guy, producer, he comes up to me and he goes, hey, man, you got one of those freaky, fucky things? <laughs> And I go, what? And he goes, one of those freaky fucky things. You know, one of those things that go, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh. I go, oh, you're talking about a quicker. I mean, are you freaking? Just before I said crazy, Chico Faro comes over and says to me, oh, what Bobby means is that that is for Brazilian music. This is a charanga thing. We don't use that. And then I jumped in. I go, yeah, what well, Maestro Faro says. That's a whole totally different culture, which you, you specifically want this to be Cuban for the Cuban and Puerto Rican market here in New York. It was for Café Bustelo, which uh, is a, yeah. a Puerto Rican coffee. So if I would have continued and go, what are you freaking crazy, man? What are you stupid? You know, like that kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. I would have been fired. Oh, yeah. yeah. And they would have said, get rid of this guy. And then, of course, that would have carried over to the, to the uh, composer arranger contractor who was Mauricio the contractor at the time and Chico Ofar was the composer arrange you know it would have it would have just had a cascading effect of negativity mm -hmm. I was in the right but you know I had to remember that I'm not in the Bronx having to deal with with surviving on the street where you have to have some kind of attitude because if not people think you aren't hard you're soft and you know they take advantage of you so it, it's it's that kind of uh of a thing but man those were great days uh thank god for mauricio i did so many jingles so many things that that i would listen on and i did i did things sometimes that you never even got to hear i did a nike jingle that i did all of the percussion on it hmm. it was like in a rumba kind of a thing oh wow and they they said no because it sounds too much like los muñequitos de matanzas oh, they had an oh, oh. musicologist on set saying it sounds too much like a, a folkloric recording from Cuba and this, that, and the other. And on stuff. a Nike commercial, too. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, there was no singing on it or anything. Yeah. It was like all a cartoon all kind of a thing, morphing yeah. into things all fast. Uh, you know, things like that. Sometimes you do things in the jingle scene that are so intensely musical that you go, man, it's a shame this is a... A, a TV commercial or or a radio commercial. It should be a song, you know, on an album, you know. But that's a testimony to whoever's writing the music. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. But now well, everything is Pro Tools and, and things like that. Yeah. Oh, everything's, yeah, all digital. Uh, which brings us to one of the points I want to bring up is, is with this pandemic, I know people are kind of just hunkering down, learning, they're studying. Uh, Anything you we could learn from you as well, please tell us where we could do some more research. And I know you have a, a, a radio show as well, too. Oh, yeah, the radio show. Yeah, Fridays. for all of you watching, uh, it's Friday nights. 
from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern time. So that would be 6 p.m. West Coast time. It's on the number one jazz station in the nation, WBGO FM out of Newark. Because of the pandemic, I, I, I've been all of the announcers, we've been taping our shows from home. So actually, I have a little mini recording studio here. Just And a mini recording studio is what? Just a mic and a computer, man. That's it. That's all you need. But anyway, uh, tomorrow is val uh, this weekend is Valentine's Day, so I've selected music that's apropos. But it's called the Latin Jazz Cruise, C-R-U-I-S-E. And if you missed the show, it's archived for two weeks. You can always go to WBGO Latin Jazz Cruise the next day and for the next two weeks. For the radio show, to listen to it live, go to WBGO.org. And you'll be able to. So I'll see everybody on the radio uh, tomorrow night, hopefully. And uh, you'll learn a lot because I always drop a lot of information. In fact, uh, my students at the uh, at NYU and at the new school, I always give them a, a weekly radio question that they have to answer. So they have to listen and uh, they uh, they have to answer me. They send me an email with the answer or a text, et cetera. So the only way that you're going to learn about the culture and the music is by listening to it and experiencing it. You can learn the mechanics of anything. Listen, man, you want to learn how to take out an appendix? There's manuals on how to do that for doctors. But until you go in there into the operating room and see somebody do it, and then you have to do it. And luckily for us, doctors practice on cadavers and things like that. You're not going to really experience what it, it's about. So I would suggest to anybody, uh, you might be able to play a double stroke roll on the congas at a blistering tempo on the uh, metronome. But how do you use that musically in context on the bandstand? That's a whole nother thing. And anybody that's a producer watching this will tell you the same thing. You know, just have Steve Smith when he got into Journey. How I, Steve is an incredible jazz drummer, incredible. When I was a freshman, he was a senior at Berkeley, could read anything. Then he gets into Journey, and all of a sudden he has to play backbeat on a slow rock ballad, and has to change his whole complete thinking to fit the music, etc. So, our job as musicians is to adapt to the musical situation and provide what is necessary. Sometimes what is necessary is a suggestion that we may make. But, you know, I always ask it or make the suggestion with a certain degree of respect and humbleness because, you know, this is a service industry that we're in. When I get called up as a sideman, I think that's why I'm a good band leader, is because uh, I uh, I know when I'm called up, I, I, I'm i called up to first because hopefully they like the way I play and what I can provide. But sometimes they don't know what I can provide. If I get called up on a session and I play, and I'm playing drum set on it, and I, on the way out, I see a set of congas there. And I go, you know something, uh, this could use a conga track. If you want it, I can play. I really do know how to play congas. Oh, really? Great. Uh, come on, you know, set up the congas. Bobby's going to lay down a conga track. What did you have in mind? I go, well, this. And then, go, oh, man, that'd be perfect, et cetera. And, of course, if you don't want to use it, you could always not use it, but et cetera, et cetera. So, obviously, also let people know the talents that you have or else, you know, nobody's going to – Know that if Mauricio Smith hadn't let the producers at Saturday Night Live know, hey, I can play harmonica, I know how to play blues harp, Dan Aykroyd wouldn't have a career as the blue in the Blues Brothers. So. Right. Yeah, and there's a, I mean, there's a lot of Latin influence in American music, and I know you've sent me a lot of information regarding that as well. Oh, totally, totally. Yeah. The whole thing. Yeah. Listen, I'm gonna tap out the clave of song right now. Uh, if I just tap two and four. Soy un chico divertido que vengo para gozar. 
Traigo la metangala pachango. And I, and I just stopped there because uh, I've been doing that for the last hour and almost <laughs> hours. So. <laughs> for those of you man, that, 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 incessant, clave, the whole that, that incessant tapping is driving me crazy. So, But I just <laughs> tapped the clave of son there and put a backbeat and you got a funk rhythm. The basis, yeah. the basis of funk is, uh, is uh, the clave. Just ask Dave Garibaldi, man. Oh, yeah. Now, he didn't know that, but once he started studying with Mike Spiro, who I still believe is an LP Mike artist. Spiro. Yeah, yeah, he is. He's family. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, he's family. So he, he he finally started realizing that. A lot of these things are very simple. They're very, um, like what I just did. You know who hit me to that? Keith Copeland. Because yeah. one day I told him, man, I want to get my funk playing a little bit more together. And he goes, man, you already play funk and you don't even know it, man. Yeah. He starts playing the clave, the basis of, you know, because Keith was African American. He was from Flushing, I believe. No, he was from Jamaica, Queens. He grew up with Billy Cobham and Lenny White. They were boyhood friends. Even though Billy was from Brooklyn, they used to hang out together. So yeah. um, he goes, Man, you play funk already. You don't even know it, man. He goes, The basis of funk is clave. And he starts doing what I was just doing. And he starts tapping to it. And then he starts permutating everything. Yeah. And I'm going, uh, my mouth drops, uh, you know. Yeah. So that means, so the main, the basis of rock is, is 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 also that if I tap, like for example, if I tapped out, uh, let me see if I can tap this out. I'm a little cramped here. It's a basic bell pattern that we use. It's a basic mm. cascara pattern. It isn't the only cascara pattern that we use. A lot of people just refer to it as that. It's not. It's a bell pattern. It comes from Bantu mm. Congolese culture, um, from a, yeah. a bell called Gongui, but for a rhythm that's known as Makuta. And that got transferred to the sticks in uh, the rumba tradition. But anyway, that rhythm that I just played, and I you hear me doing the two and four, it's, it's a heavy metal rock rhythm. It's a, you know. Yeah. You could yeah. trace it all the way back to West Africa. But the problem is that we, people don't teach you these things. Uh, and if they don't teach you, you just, it's superfluous. The knowledge is, you have the knowledge to play that. That's a basic rhythm every every drummer that plays heavy metal knows. You know, yeah. you get a drummer on a drum kit, he starts going, yeah. you know, you play that so fast. It's like, but does he know or she know that it comes from West Africa through the timbales through the rumba tradition in Cuba, and then finally to Bantu Congolese tradition in, in West Africa. No. Yeah. And uh, if you did know that, you'd play the music with a little bit more respect, a little bit more essence to your uh, in terms of the soul. And the other thing, thing is, as a rock musician, uh, you wouldn't make fun of something that you don't know anything about. A lot of most people that make fun of other forms of music is because they don't know anything about that form of music. It's just like when people make fun of each other, other races. Yeah. Or listen to the way this Chinese guy talks, or this that. Or listen to the way this you know Puerto Rican guy talks. You know, it's ignorance. It, 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 it's ignorance. Yeah. So I encourage everybody: the things that you're playing today, none of it was born in a vacuum everything that you play today whether it's heavy metal punk rock salsa cuban timba which is the most modern form of cuban dance music it all has roots in something mm -hmm. okay and you just gotta go back go back go back and you'll find those roots etc etc it's, it's very popular today everybody takes blood tests to find their the ancestral dna where they come from same thing with music. You got to find that out uh, too. And that's my job uh, in terms of a, a, as being an educator. But I have all that knowledge inside of me and I bring it forth uh, and I can draw upon it when I'm on the bandstand. If you get the West Side Story reimagined recording, you hear all of that on the album. You, you hear what I'm about. You represent yourself. When you get to a certain level, you, you first start learning 
the instrument, the mechanics. Then you start imitating people. Mm. Then hopefully you start developing a style yeah. that identif identifies you. There's little things that I do that that uh, I don't have a drum kit set up now, but but if I went to the drum kit or I had a set of theme, I could show you. I go, I do this a lot. If you hear that, you know it's me. It's your signature. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like one of the signatures that I have is I, I do a lot of multitasking on the drum set. Yeah. Like, for example, I could, uh, there's a pattern that we use on the hi hat that was developed by Tito Puente, and he showed it to Mike Collazo to mm -hmm. play on the drum set so it wouldn't get in the way of the conga, bongo, and timbales. A lot of times I see guys playing drum set and they're playing a cascara pattern on the hi hat or whatever. I said, the, 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 the timbala player is doing that already. Why are you doing that? You Why know? do you have to do the same thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So the pattern on the hi hat is just one, two, three, four. It sounds like maracas. Mm -hmm. Now you do it with two hands. My Yasso do used to do it with two hands, and there's bass drum patterns that you can play. But I, I could do it with my left hand while I'm playing cascara and bell rhythms with my right hand. So that's one of the things. That I that I can do. It's not that anybody else can do, but I do it, and, and it's a signature of, That's of a my. Signature sound. It sounds yeah. like there's two guys, there, yeah. and then you have the conga player and the bongo player. So now instead of four, three guys, you have four guys. Things like yeah. that, little things like that. But you have to do these things. Obviously, at the apropos moment, you have to do them uh, uh, musically. You can't just do them arbitrarily. Ah, look what I can do. I yeah. see a lot of that happening too with young players. It's their yeah. immaturity, you know? Hey, check yeah, out what I can do. Check out what I can do. And then what happens is instead of people looking at who's soloing or the rest of the band as a whole, they're just looking at the one guy and, uh, you know, yeah. what about the rest yeah. of the band, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. So, you know, it, you want to be complimentary as a player. You want to play what's apropos. Buddy Rich said it best. You play what's apropos. Yeah. In his music, well said. he has to play that way because the arrangements call for it. But when he used to sit in with the Count Basie Orchestra, etc., man, forget it. He sounds beautiful. Uh, Buddy Rich playing with Nat King Cole, the Nat King Cole trio. Amazing. You wouldn't think it was Buddy Rich. Just amazing. Amazing. You play what's apropos. Apropos. It's, and stuff. Very, very it's, it's not about you. You get a chance. You uh, hopefully you in the bands that you're in, you, you'll get a chance to shine. Hopefully, if you're on a pop gig, usually no, forget about it. And if they give you a chance to shine, it's because what the pop artist has to do a costume change. <laughs> <laughs> so, Truth. So, Words of that's wisdom. Nother, that, that's a whole nother mindset. That's a whole nother mindset. You gotta say you you really love playing jazz rock music. And yeah. you get the chops, but you get a pop gig, and now you're not going. You're not going to be able to do that. You got to. You have to be subservient, and that shows your maturity. And then when you, and I've had students call me from the road. Yo, prof, I'm I'm going crazy here on this gig. You know, I'm not getting a chance to solo. I'm not getting. I go. You know where? Where are you right now? Seattle, yeah. Washington. He goes, man. There's got to be some jazz club somewhere with a jam session. Find out. Yeah. Well, if you meet local musicians, yeah. ask them, hey, is there a jam session around where I can go and, and, and get my rocks off and play? So they, you know, that's, so it, that's a whole nother thing, surviving the road. The, the road is a the road. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna say the road is a bitch. It isn't what it is, it isn't yeah, it can't be it, it is an enjoyable experience because you, you get to, to uh to travel, see places that you know, but it's a job. It's yeah. a job. You gotta get. You gotta get wake up calls. You gotta. You're gonna be tired at sound checks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You're gonna have problems sometimes on stage. The mo hey, yeah. what happened to the monitors tonight? You know this kind. The uh, that yeah, and the not, other. It's not. It's not romanticized as people think. Yeah, absolutely. It's tough. It's tough. Yeah. It's not for the faint hearted. It's not, it's not yeah, for yeah. the faint hearted. And if you're a woman on the road, I feel for them because it's hard for them. Even harder for them. You know. Yeah. Because they have yeah. to deal with the, the other BS. Yeah, uh, that they have to put up with sometimes that we men un sometimes inflict on them. Uh, right. But uh, yeah. the best thing I can tell you is to uh, be as professional as you possibly can be when you're on the road. 
and things th things will work out. Okay. Absolutely. And you got issues with management when you're on. The higher you go up in the food chain, in the music business, the more BS you got to put up with. I'm telling you. You see all those great rock bands and everything and all those great gigs? You're dealing with management. Yeah. And man, yeah. sometimes man, hey, we're going to replace you. Why? Because uh, we want a younger guy in the band. Or you I look a little bit too older or this, that, the other. In jazz, we don't have to deal with that so much. And Latin, and Latin jazz and, and salsa. But that happens. That happens. I've, I've heard friends talk to me about that, et cetera. People are certain artists, their egos, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, uh, be careful what you wish for sometimes. Oh, man. I, uh, uh, the way to survive it and thrive in it is be as professional as you possibly can. And sometimes you can't think, take things personally. You have to always defend yourself, obviously, if you feel something is wrong. But mm -hmm. be as professional as you possibly can be. Um, Chester Thompson has a good interview in Rolling Stone magazine right now. Check it out. A drummer who played with Phil Collins and, and Frank Zappa and Genesis. He talks a, <clears throat> a lot about that. So check it out. One of the best. And the other thing right now in terms of the pandemic, I know you're leading up to that. Things are going to get better. My wife, Elena, we talked about this at length about a month ago. She hit me to the fact that in 1918, the pandemic lasted for three years. 50 million people died worldwide. And what happens in 1921? The Roaring 20s. The Roaring 20s. And for the next, you know, and, and the Roaring 20s survived the Great Depression and all of that stuff. And that was the most one of the most explosive time periods in music when big band jazz develops. Jazz becomes the popular music. Just explodes, yeah. yeah. And so, so well we, we things are going to explode again when when we uh, when we come out of this. The main thing is to stay positive. Yep. Uh, communicate with your family and your friends. They'll always be a source of inspiration when you're down in the dumps. We have the Jerry, me and you, like ten years ago, we wouldn't even think of like having a Zoom call or anything like that. <laughs> and at, at least now we can, so we yeah. we can do these kind of things. But and always also keep practicing because we live in a technologically based society right now. But the fact that you can play an instrument very well freaks most people out because with computers today, I remember, God, it just came into my head. Uh, Joe Zawino from Weather Report, he had a clinic for the Korg polyphonic synthesizer at Ray Burns Music in 1979. I remember my freshman year. I'm sorry, 1975, my freshman year in, in uh, at the Berklee College of Music, 75. And we all went there. And Korg had developed an eight-note polyphonic synthesizer. Before that, it was just a mini move, one note at a time. So now you could play chords on the synthesizer. So he plays something. Everybody applauds. First question, it was a kid from New England Conservatory down the block from us from Berkeley. He asked, Mr. Zavano, what do you think the future of music is going to be? He goes, the future of music? A lot of bull. Mm. Everybody will be able to push a button and say they're a musician. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's, but, if there is a lot really of that. Play, yeah. but if you can really play an instrument, really play it and play it well, It freaks people out. Yeah. And there will, always be out. there will always be a demand for us. So I'm not worried about me or, you know, or and I'm not worried about any any of you watching out there that are striving to get your thing together on your instrument or have, I was, well, we're always striving. I would say I have my thing together somewhat, but I'm always still searching, getting to the next level, this, that, and the other, trying. And that not only happens through practicing, but also listening to different kinds of music all the time. So don't just listen to one thing. It's nice to eat hot dogs with mustard. You know, it's a comfort food. But if I ate that all the time and drank soda, I'd be fat and I'd be farting a lot. <laughs> you want to vary your right. diet. Yeah. Musically, vary your diet. Yeah, take care Great. of yourself. and yeah. yeah, You're super into salsa. Great. You're a salsero. Die hard, muchacho. Forget it. Yeah, yeah. But Listen to other things as well. Try to listen to something completely different 
than that. Folk music, you know, from uh, Bulgaria or whatever, you know. I mean, yeah, what do you think all the hip? Good. What do you think all the hip producers are sampling? Yeah, they're checking yeah. out other things. Mm -hmm. Very anyway, true. Does anybody have any other questions? Any uh, another question? Or? Somebody asked whether uh, if you teach online um, and uh, where can we find all your information? Uh, where can we find out what's, what what you're working on? What the latest projects are? And, well, there's a couple of I'm I'm <clears throat> the latest project we were working on was doing a new album with the Multiverse Big Band. It was and I wasn't I'm not going to say what the music is about because I want it to be a surprise. But we were set to record a new live album. The first week of June at Dizzy's Club Coca Cola. That West Side Story reimagined recording that we did, we recorded it live at Dizzy's Club Coca Cola in New York City. So, what you hear is what you get. So, the musicians did an incredible job. And I even surprised myself. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, we were going to do a new album. So, when Dizzy's opens up again, <clears throat> And uh, we'll we'll be going there to perform live and record that music live. And there's a couple of new albums out that are out. Uh, there's an album by a great vocalist from Argentina, Gabriela, uh, Gabriela Anders, Gabriela Anders, A N D as in David E R S. It's called Los Dukes, L O S, and then Dukes like Duke uh, Ellington, D U K E S. She took the music of Duke Ellington and arranged it for three horns. She did all of the arrangements, all of the multi-tracking on the vocals, and I'm playing drums and percussion on it, along with Orestes Abrantes, another LP artist. And I'm very proud of this recording. It's all Duke Ellington music and uh, just fabulously done. And she did a very smart thing that I'm going to pass on to uh, you would-be producers right now, especially those of you who are doing jazz-oriented music. All of the songs are less than three minutes long. Not, not, oh, I'm sorry, not less than three minutes, but around three minutes long. The longest song, I think, is four minutes and four seconds. Oh, wow. And then within that context, there's solos and everything. And, of course, you know, it's getting a lot of airplay because DJs in the jazz world, they're looking at some, man, I got three, I got three, I got four minutes left in my show, five minutes left. I got to find something. I got to find, oh, let me put on this thing by Gabriela Anders. Mm. It just came out. This is yeah. three minutes and two seconds. This is perfect. And it's a great Duke Ellington tune and this, that, and the other. So very proud of that. I'm check it out. It just came out. I'll probably play something of it from the and it's all different rhythms. Merengue, Haitian compa. Um, there's some funk nice. on it, cha cha cha, mambo. Yeah. Um, wow. it, it, it's very varied. It's a collection uh, of uh, everything, yeah. Yeah, so so it's drop drawing upon your culture, drawing upon your culture because she knew I'm I know all those styles of music. Hey, Bobby, what, what would work with this? We're, we're, and we we test drove the music at uh, a place called the 55 Bar in New York City, which is where Jaco Pastorius used to hang out and all these great, all the great musicians from Saturday Night Live, they all hang out there. They all play there. We all play there on our off when we're not traveling. So we had the music well rehearsed. And then she started cutting it down. And, and But she's fabulous. She wrote all of the arrangements. She's very rare in that sense, and she was she's uh she used to be big in the smooth jazz scene. She was signed to Warner Brothers, and George Duke was her uh, producer. But she didn't want to do that music anymore. She wanted to do real music with real musicians, improvising this, that, and the other out of a controlled environment, yeah. and uh, into uh, an environment where the musicians are featured as soloists. So I'm glad that that we did that recording, and and, and it's out now. You can check it out. It's called Gabriella. Anders, A N D E R S, Los Dukes, L O S, and then D, D U K E S. Okay, and you, you can check it out. And wow. you hear a bunch of LP bells on there and everything else, and LP congas. So, uh, wow. um, and, uh, and in terms of getting in touch with me, anybody wants to get in touch with me, uh, you can get in touch with me through Facebook. I'm on just Bobby Sanabri on Facebook. I have two pages on Facebook. Of, a personal page and a fan page on Facebook, both Bobby Sanabria. And uh, my uh, website is bobbysanabria.com. Very simple. And uh, I'll give you my email. You can, you can go to N-U-J-A-C-K, that's New Jack, R-I-C-A-N at yahoo.com. I don't, I, the only way I'm teaching privately now is, is through 
NYU and uh, uh, through the new school. In fact, I have a student waiting for me now. Nice. Um, but if anybody's interested, I, I might I, I might consider it. Uh, I'll interview you and see how serious you are and this and that. At, th at this point, I don't take beginners or anything like that. Uh, I'm I only take people that are advanced and want to get their playing to the next level. But I, I'm. But if you have a question, also I, I I'm more than willing to give you advice and steer you in the right uh, direction. So, Abs that's beautiful. Thank you so much once again, Bobby, for all your time. And I, I encourage anybody to go check out his stuff and reach out to him. Bobby's always been a very open about uh, wanting anybody who's interested in wanting to learn or, or dive deeper into the culture. So thank you so much once again, Bobby. I mean, uh, hopefully we'll do this again too. I mean, we'll go to New York and do the, the uh, you know, LP rhythm jam again. Once, once again, when things kind of uh, open up again, you know, so I'm really hoping that'll, that'll yeah. happen, but there's we had a lot such more a great to talk time about. Time too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. There's a lot more to talk about. I want to thank Jules for uh, the head of education and thank you, Jerry, and everybody uh, connected with LP now. Uh, I'm very proud that I'm part of the company simply because uh, I wasn't part of the company in its early days because the company, I think, was founded in 1964, I believe. But I came in when I was uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the early 1980s, and I've been... And that means that uh, I've been with the company in terms of my association 41 years. So that's, uh, I'm very proud that, I, and I've been, uh, oh, that's another thing I want to mention to you guys out there that are listening and watching. Uh, in this business, people admire loyalty. You know, many of my brethren, when things started changing in the industry, left LP for what they thought were high pastures or whatever simply because they weren't thinking. And uh, LP has always been steadfast in terms of supporting me and many others. And when I've had disagreements, et cetera, with the company on certain things, <clears throat> I've voiced my opinion and I've always, uh, there was always an, an open door to talk about things and uh, rectify things. It, uh, whether it's something that I, I looked at it in an ad that I thought was possibly not kosher, as we would say in New York City, or the way maybe I, I was I, I was treated in a certain occasion or whatever. But I've always I, I've always been able to voice my opinion, and uh, that that's what you want in a company, somebody that will listen, because we're human beings and we make mistakes, we all make mistakes. But the whole thing is to be able to have a platform to speak and to get those opinions out and work things out. So, so I'm very proud of my association, and especially the history that LP has. We wouldn't have instruments in the Latin scene if it wasn't for LP when Marty came on the scene. Um, and uh, oh, also the last thing I want to talk about real quick is my association. I almost forgot about this with the Bronx Music Heritage Center, where I am the course artistic director with my wife Elena Martinez. Maybe you could show a picture of the right now of what the inside of the current Bronx Music Heritage Center, uh, where we have like, I believe, I think we have like 15 LP congas in there because we've been teaching uh, classes for beginners and uh, more advanced players. Uh, occasionally I will come in and sub, but Jorge Vasquez has been teaching those classes. And, uh, and thank we you, have, by the way, too, on that. That's incredible. 50 congas in there. That's <laughs> not, not 50, not 50, 15, 50. Oh, 50, I was going to say, that's a lot of congas in there. <laughs> yeah, we have about 15 congas there and uh, provided at low cost for by, yeah. by LP. So we really thank LP for that. But uh, if you can't get the picture up, uh, hopefully you can get the picture up. It's toward the end there in your – but we've been doing – for the last eight years, I've been – we've been producing concerts there. Talleres, uh, lectures, film screenings, uh, dance classes, everything wow. we've done. We teach capoeira there. We've been doing all these incredible things. We have special events. We're always, everything we do is Bronx-centric, dealing with the Bronx musical community. That means mm -hmm. the Garifuna community from Honduras. Oh, from Honduras uh, yeah. we, uh, the Colombian community, Ecuadorian community, Mexican community. 
obviously the Puerto Rican community, the Dominican community, the Jewish community, everything. We've wow. done everything there that you can imagine. And we're still doing it there remotely. That's the inside wow, of the Proximity Heritage Center there. And uh, that's one of the beautiful Tama drum sets that I play. Wow. Provided to me by Tama, one of my other endorsers, Sabian. I want to shout out to Sabian, Remo Drumheads, and Vic Fred Sticks. There's a couple of the congas there. That's a setup for a rehearsal there. Uh, we, and then uh, we were supposed to move from that place that holds about 80 people to a place that uh, we're actually building a theater, a small theater that holds 250 seats with an outdoor amphitheater that's called the Bronx Music Hall. It was supposed to be done. We were supposed yeah. to open in September, but because of the pandemic, the construction stopped. But it started again, and this is what it looks like. You see that archway is the entrance wow. to the theater? Yeah. On the side of the building, the building has 315 apartments, all multi-scaled in terms of rents from low income. Uh, it's basically low and middle income. And then on the side, on the outside is an amphitheater that will be able to do outside concerts as well. But inside, it's a 250-seat theater. So hopefully we'll be open by, wow. June, by June or July. It's, the theater is almost done. I was just yeah. there the other day. Look. Overseeing, looking at not overseeing, but just looking at the construction, how they're going along. So me and Elena are my wife, Elena Martinez, the great noted folklorist. We've been the co-artistic directors of the BMHC, and now we we're, we're moving to the Bronx Music Hall there soon. So we'll be having LP events there. Particularly, one of the things that I'm going to uh, do is on during the summer months, we're going to have Sabado de Rumba. Rumba Saturdays and Sunday bom plenazos, bomba and plena, are Afro Puerto Rican traditions on Sundays. So in the outdoor amphitheater, as weather permits, to bring back that drumming culture that I experienced growing up in New York City. When you're talking about many of the players that many of you admire that are watching this, like Nicky Marrero, Ralph Rizari, uh, uh, Eddie Montalvo. Johnny hey. Rodriguez, et cetera, who I'm, uh, you know, their, their colleagues and friends. These people, we all grew up learning how to play in the street. And when we grew up, check it out, if you didn't have congas, all the cars were made out of metal then. So you get a good car, like an Oldsmobile or a Chevrolet, <laughs> you start playing the Salidor on the, on the bumper, the Quinto on the hood, you take a, two combs, Start tapping for the for the guagua, the cascara, et cetera. So you tap it on a beer bottle, the clave, you sing, you have a rumba on a car. Of course, unfortunately, if the same way that again. car, they get, get get pissed off. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we used that's, to that's we, in the street. You you we used to do that. We we used to do that, man. I, can you imagine that? A bunch of kids, man, doing that uh, in New York City, Puerto Rican kids mostly doing that in New York City, and then maybe somebody like Kako would buy, come by that, like who I mentioned before, who's a professional percussionist musician at the time, uh, famous timbalero, like I said before, the yeah. timbalero for the Alegre All-Stars. And he'd come in and start playing quinto on the car, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, or show us something, show us something. So, wow. so it, it, that's the environment that I grew up in. Of course, you can't do that anymore. If you want to get a good idea of how it was me growing up, see those two movies, The French Connection and Serpico. Si quieren tener una idea de la juventud de mi vida, vean esas dos películas, The French Connection y Serpico, uh, and uh, watch another a documentary that's called From Mambo to Hip Hop. Un documental que se llama From Mambo to Hip Hop. From Mambo to Hip Hop, you can see it on YouTube right now. It's about an hour. And you see me as a talking head in there. And, and the little segment where Benny Bonilla, who's retired now, but was an early LP endorser, talks about that, playing on somebody's car, rumba, in, in, the, in the South Bronx. Can you imagine? Yeah, check, that check this out, man. In all of the projects where I grew up, when uh, uh, they started change they, to save money because they were doing so many repairs on the bathrooms in the projects, 
because of leaks and because the plaster was coming off, they decided, the city decided to line all of the bathrooms with tile, with tile. So when I took a shower and I hit the tile, boom, I go, man, this sounds like a conga. And then you go, pa, like that. So you stop like, boom, pa, ka, ka, boom, go, pa, ka, to get the broom, pa, pa, ka, ka, ta, on the tiles in the bathroom. I'll be in the shower. My mother be yelling at me, stop hitting the tiles, you know. <laughs> you know. So so those are the kind of things that we did, man, when, when we were a kid. I didn't have a conga, so I practiced on the wall there, you know. I, I love that found sound. That's exactly. I saw a documentary too somewhere in Brazil. The kids don't they don't have instruments, so they made instruments out of whatever they could find, their outfits and everything. So, wh whatever you yeah, can yeah. find, that's, that's what it is, you know. Well, that's it's, it's that's, like, that's, yeah, that's how hip hop started. That's how hip hop started when yeah. they stopped all the music programs in New York City. And I failed to mention this before when they I talked about talk, taking off all the music programs. When they took all the music programs off. A lot of those kids that wanted to learn how to play alto, tenor, whatever, yeah. you talk to an early DJ like Rakim. He goes, man, I wanted to be the next John Coltrane on tenor saxophone. But the school that I was at, they stopped the music oh, program. Man. So a friend of mine had turntables and said, hey, you can check, make music like this, scratching and on, as a yeah. DJ. So that's what people started doing. I, start, I, man, I saw that when it was born because uh, cool DJ Herc, there was a high school across from the projects that I grew up called Alfred E. Smith High School. It's still there. It's called Bronx Vocational High School. When cool DJ Herc used to go to that high school, you learn how to be an electrician, a plumber, a carpenter, uh, a machinist. My father went there when he came from Puerto Rico to learn a uh, machine shop. Anyway, I saw cool DJ Herc for the first time taking out turntables in the park. Right across from be, the park was between the cement parks that the city constructed for all of the projects. That park was between Alfred E. Smith and my projects. So I saw cool DJ Herc when he came out with the techniques turn, techniques turntables for the first time. He put them on two pillows <laughs> and started DJing in the park. I, I, you know, so I have mad love for hip hop. It's not a you know like uh, sometimes our jazz brethren. They, they they say some stupid things uh, about certain styles of music. It just means you're closed-minded. Open your mind up. You know, there's good and bad in all forms of music. The thing yeah. is that when it's done well, you got to give it props. That's so it. I, 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 I grew up, and, and check it out. Because of that film from Mambo to Hip Hop that you're gonna, all of you are going to see now on YouTube, and I, um, I got to meet Cool DJ Herc years later. Now we're friends. And a lot of all the other early pioneers like Grandmaster Kaz and Charlie Chase and and, and others, you know. So, so yeah. I mean, the first the, the first the first Latino DJ was a guy named uh, DJ Disco Wiz, right, Elena? Sorry. Disco Wiz was the first Latino DJ. Yeah. Yeah, DJ Disco Wiz, and then they just call him the Wiz. He was Cuban American, Cubano. And then the second Latino DJ was Charlie Chase, who was Puerto Rican, New York Rican. New York Rican. And, yeah. and, he, and, and he, I mean, basically, he did he mix some of his culture and, and some of the music, I'm pretty sure, as well, too. Uh -huh. or, he, he would mix his culture into the music as well, too. I'm oh, yeah, sure. because you, uh, yeah. the early DJs were musicians. Yeah. Charlie Chase plays bass. Nice. Yeah. He used to play bass in, in salsa groups. You know, wow. little local salsa bands. You know, but then he he got he he fell in love more with the DJ culture. You know, and uh, so so uh, yeah, um, a lot of the cats uh, were played played instruments back then. A lot of them, you could hear it in their in their remixes and in their uh, the way they sampled the yeah, cho cool. the their, the choices they would make. They would sample like Bob James. They would sample Count Basie. They would sample Tito Puente, etc. Nice. There isn't that much thought today, in my opinion, yeah. in terms of production on the hip hop side because everything is technology based. Mm -hmm. Where back then the cats would go, man, check out this horn line on this bar on this Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers record. Let's stick in four seconds of it in here, or whatever. 
or a drum pattern from a James Brown recording, etc. So now it's more sound effects and and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the uh, and even the topics that, that that the rappers are talking about uh, sometimes leave much to be desired. I still have mad love for it. I mean, especially the battle rappers, the guys that and girls that go one on one and they just improvise. Mm. They, yeah. they, they, because they're like jazz musicians. Yeah. They're virtuosic yeah. in their wordplay. Yeah. The same way that we're virtuosic in Puerto Rico when we do the decima tradition, which is from the mountains of Puerto Rico, where a person has to do uh, 10 stanzas in octosyllabic fashion and rhyme it all. And at the end, give something, what we call a pies forzado for the other declamador, the other vocalist to riff off of. Same tradition, mm -hmm. or what they call in Jamaica and Trinidad, uh, X tempo, you know, mm. so wow. so these traditions of improvising are very deep, but and in back in when I was coming up, man, see the, the rapping thing also comes from playing the dozens. Mm. The dozens came from African American culture where you insult somebody in rhyme. Okay. Yeah. And and uh that's where the extension of that is the battle rapping uh today. Right. So 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 those cats that you give them like one word and they can come up with a whole soliloquy on one word. Yeah, you can tell a battle rap. Okay, your word is pro pro uh, pro uh, pro and they do a whole rap on it. And they'll go <laughs> off on a tangent. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That that's mm -hmm. that's an art form. That's definitely an art form. Yeah. 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 Anyway, we're getting we're getting uh, we got to close up the show, man. Man, how many how many hours have we talked? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we got to make a part two or something, but, but definitely, Bobby, thank you so much for spending your time with us and for sharing your story. Seriously, you know, it, can't wait to see you again in person when this whole mess is over. Um, we could run your social media again and your website and all that information. Uh, you can find Bobby at these uh, websites and, and locations. And, um, and Bobby, you've been a brand ambassador for many years. Thank you for your passion. For, thank you for your dedication, for your knowledge, and for educating us today. Thank you so much. Gracias y a todo el mundo que está uh, mirando esto. Eh, fue un placer para mí. Bobby Sanabria, un hijo de padres puertorriqueños del sur del Bronx. Uh, thank you so much, Jules, and thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, this is Bobby Sanabria, a proud SOB, a son of the Bronx of Puerto Rican parents. Thank you. And thank you to uh, Jules. Uh, Jerry, again, as I said, and to LP. I'll see okay. everybody on the radio tomorrow night. See you hopefully on stage somewhere sooner than later. And you know how to contact me if you have any questions. Muchísimas gracias y mucho ache, much positive energy. Keep the faith. The pandemic is only temporary. The music is forever. Bye-bye. Stay safe, everybody. <laughs>